All right, all right. So welcome, everybody. Uh, this is episode eight of uh, Carth Riders now. Uh, CDM is done, and we just released the monster mammoth episode from the uh, Super Mario Kart World Championship. I don't know. What do you call it? Roundup? Recap? Sure, that works. Tons of information, and uh, yeah, that was a good... That was close to four hours, I think, before Joe cut it down to size to just the three. Yeah. Two dope to Joe. <laughs> two uh, <laughs> two, two uh, hour and a half parts. So, yeah, there's a lot of information in both those episodes, for sure. Yeah, basically, if you have any question about Super Mario Kart or the uh, in especially the World Championship, that's where you want to check it out. So let's get to it. Uh, the introductions this time. Uh, Joe, you're going to start us off. And I want to know things you waste your time with on YouTube. Okay. Uh, well, I am Joe Reinreb. Uh, and things I waste my time with on YouTube on the top of my head would probably be bad political stuff. <laughs> because that seems to be all the rage here in the States. So, yeah, I, uh, I waste a lot of time with that. <laughs> Could you could you be a bit more specific, like bad political stuff, just people yeah. talking or debates? It's mostly yeah. I like the Rubin Report. I watch a lot. Um, Stephen Crowder, um, basically stuff that's kind of like against the norm. I would say there's a there's a huge political shift happening here in the United States, and uh, I don't exactly want to keep on top of it, but it's just it kind of entertains me from time to time to see like the outrageous points of view that people kind of have on YouTube. So it kind of entertains me a lot. <laughs> all right, all right. It's kind of funny you should ask that. I uh, I just watched the Goose video, but I wouldn't call it wasting time because it's very entertaining content. Um, I do watch a lot of uh, science videos, uh, like scientific debates about physics or just you know very big questions trying to be answered by uh, by science uh, established scientific professors. Uh, I also watch a lot of football videos like Ronaldinho compilations, Messi oh. compilations, that stuff. I waste a lot of time doing that. Um, right. But it's enjoyable. Uh, and you know, everyone goes through that. Like they sometimes have a, an evening and they just keep on clicking the related link or just letting auto play mm -hmm. take over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before you know it, two hours are gone. The, so, the yeah. YouTube maelstrom. Yep, the yep. rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely victim to that sometimes. All right. So uh, you're up, Ryan. Yeah. Well, the the funny thing is, you know, I don't really consider myself wasting time on YouTube. Uh, I actually just I just pulled up my stats, my time watched. In the past week, I've spent 17 hours and four minutes watching YouTube, which is a daily average of two hours 26 minutes. So daily average, and. Uh, Wow, it says there's tools on the YouTube app that say, remind me to take a break, which I have turned off. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think partly because, you know, I'm making videos myself, I'm trying to build a channel myself, um, I don't consider it time wasted because I consider it kind of like learning what other people are doing, what works for them, all that kind of stuff, right? So, you know, I'll watch some of the um bigger bigger youtubers like pewdiepie and phil defranco and sometimes drama alert and all this kind of stuff and see what's going on and uh i, I just don't think it's a waste of time for me you know it's what i do i wouldn't really consider yeah. it a waste of time either if it's only two hours of your day that's a, that's not really that bad because i'll spend a whole work day like eight hours worth just listening to podcasts like joe rogan and he's got three hour shows so that's not really time wasted no, exactly, and it's it's like two hours a day. It's like, okay, I don't really play video games right now at all. I don't watch TV, so if that's like what I'm, you know, if that's my wasted time of the day, then that's it. That's not too bad. Oh, that's fine. That's yeah. like okay. one movie or a couple of episodes of a show. That's whatever. Yeah, that's not bad at all. All right, so uh, my name is Sargoth or Marius. Uh, you know the jingle. <laughs> Marius talks about. Oh, it is. Okay. For sake. okay. Um, I tend to waste a lot of time watching, uh, uh, yeah, sort of political debates, but regarding religion. So atheism, science versus theologians, stuff like that. I, 
I kind of wish I did like um, Ryan here and pull up some stats, but I'm I'm too afraid. I <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want to know the answer. Uh, a lot of time spent on that. I just spent uh, four hours the last two days watching Jordan Peters Peterson debate Sam Harris. Uh, it was released by Pangburn University or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. I couldn't pull myself away, just watching two elderly men debate about God, or not. <laughs> do you uh, do you watch any Penn Jillette videos, by any chance? Yeah, yeah, I've seen a few. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like where he's coming from. He's got that libertarian attitude to him. Yeah, he is used by, uh, he is used as an example by atheists quite a lot, because he does the, so he's an outspoken atheist, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and he does magic tricks. He does. <laughs> uh, so they kind of juxtaposition the illusion with the religion. So you can be baffled by the magic and say, oh, how did he do that? That's not possible. Mm-hmm. But you know it's fake, even though it seems real. And that's sort of the, um, the image uh, people tend to give religion. Anyway, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shout outs to uh, Christopher Hitchens, by the way. Always those yes. type of videos. He is like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess that's it for the introduction. Um, bring it over to the news. So, Carol, do you want to start off with the uh, the Mario Kart 64 and Double Dash? Oh right. Matches. Yeah. So that was uh, I. I've, it's the speedrun.com Twitch channel, which. Until today, I must, uh, I'm must i afraid to admit I did not know existed, but it's very interesting. Uh, they had an MK64 speedrun race and an MKDD speedrun race. And interspersed was the YouTube video by Summoning Salt about uh, Mario Kart Wii. Shout out. Ultra shortcut uh, development through the years. And was, all, all in all, it was a very entertaining Mario Kart block. Um, uh, so MK64... It was uh, basically the best two speedrunners um, in the world, Matthias Rustemeyer and uh, Beg Um They were commentated by uh, Mark Jones and Andrew Weatherton, who did an excellent job. Unfortunately, Mark Jones lost his connection like three or four times in the oh. process, but it didn't really hurt anything uh, because they still did a very good job. And the race itself, it was the non-skip category because the, I think they wanted that format because it tends to lead to closer races. Like with Shortcut, if you miss one, an important one, then uh, there tends to be like big gaps immediately between the two racers. And non-Shortcut is less like that. And the race reminded me a little bit of uh, Senna versus Prost in Formula 1 in the 90s. <laughs> where Ebon, Ebony played the role of Senna, doing the faster driving, getting the best lap splits, uh, just pulling out the spectacular stuff, and Matthias was just being super solid in the Prost role, um, as you would expect from him, right? Because he's very consistent. That's right. what he's known for. Um, so, barring uh, Toad's Turnpike, actually, where he hit an uncharacteristic amount of traffic, uh, so at that point, Ebony was in the lead, but eventually... Uh, Chaco Mountain happened, uh, and Epney actually fall, fell back uh, in the ravine, back on the road at the beginning of the lap, which is the worst crash you can do in this entire run, I believe. So he lost like 15 seconds there, and after that, it was an uphill battle for him. And uh, Matthias not really making any mistakes and getting good RNG on top of it. He had like a bunch of mushrooms uh, that he could cut grass with. So in the end, the difference was, I think, a little less than 10 seconds. At Rainbow Road, so it was still a good race. Yeah, so Abney did manage to make up some time after that oh, yeah. initial horror. He was, well, he pretty much only really lost it on Chaco Mountain. Um, yeah. And without Chaco Mountain, he would have the better average course time, I think. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, was uh, Matthias aware of uh, Beck Abney's mistake? This I do not know. Because uh, they had a post-match interview, uh, but uh, Matthias didn't get his mic to work. So right. It's yeah. definitely European audio tech. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we I, I don't know. Yeah, because that ben, would influence his driving, right? Yeah, yeah. And Beck actually commented on the Chaco Mountain crash that he, and I recognize this because I have also done this myself during tournaments, is that he, he played it too safe. 
and then he doesn't have muscle memory developed for playing it mm, safe. Yeah, yeah. So he did a slow MT, and he bumped into the into the mountainside, which spit him back out, uh, and then he crashed, fell back. So uh, yeah, it was interesting. And then after that, we had the double dash uh, all cups um, with um, the world champion and world record holder of the all cups category, Goomba, Goomba NL uh, versus Optimistic Emo. The American who is ranked number three at the moment. Um, and it was a bit of an uneven race um, because I think from the get go, pretty much Goomba has been in the lead and did not give the lead away. And he started really on fire. Uh, for example, the first three blue shells that went his way, he dodged all three. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which is kind of <laughs> difficult to do in double dash. I mean, if you get one blue shell dodge in a run, you would basically already be like oh yeah i did that <laughs> just three in a row <laughs> that's crazy and on top of just being a better driver emo had terrible terrible rng oh it was like, horrible uh, he got yeah. mario Kart it to the max yeah, absolutely right? <laughs> i think there were like four blue shells on rainbow road alone which is ridiculous and lightning like every course <laughs> exactly every course he had Jeez. major stuff happening and goomba i believe only got lightning once in the entire run yeah, it was a huge discrepancy it was in the uh... pretty unfair. Uh, so it ended up with one minute and four seconds win uh, for Goomba. But I th but uh, David or Optimus Emo did go away with the hearts of the audience by doing the blue shell skip on Bowser Castle, which is really cool. So basically, you throw a blue shell at yourself. You throw it backwards and then it comes back to you. And if you do that at the finish line, you can, you know, you fly up in the air and you hit a checkpoint trigger. And that way you skip half the lap, <laughs> which is something that has not been done uh, on a on a live stream race before. Yeah, I was going to say I never even saw that shortcut before. Yeah, it's pretty rare because you have to get a blue shell to do it. It's really cool, though. It's the same principle as uh, Waluigi Stadium, right? Yeah. Except you need a blue shell to do it, so you can't set it up without a blue shell. No, right. Yeah. yeah. And, th okay, so I'm almost done here, but uh, they <laughs> also did a time trial one try uh, face off after that, uh, yeah. where the format was that they could basically pick a track of choice, and then uh, it was a first to five wins, and the guy who lost gets to pick the next track. Um, so. I think they started with Luigi Raceway. Uh, maybe that's default, just being the first track. And Goomba won that one. And then Emo picked the track, um, which I don't actually remember which track he picked second. But uh, anyway, it started. Goomba started out strong again, um, yeah. taking a 4-0 four, four lead. And then Emo made a comeback through um, Waluigi Coliseum. Um, and in the meanwhile, Goomba actually, uh, that's just, this is crazy, on, on Peach Beach, uh, his one try was a top five time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that's that's unheard of. He beat Druvan's PR in a one try. <laughs> Druvan yeah, being that. like a double dash champion for five years or something. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's just just ridiculous, unheard of. But then um, luck shifted a little bit, and Emo won uh, Waluigi Coliseum, and Emo won Bowser Castle. So <laughs> try dry uh, desert. Yeah, and dry dry desert by a couple of hundreds. I, yeah, it was not much. Yeah, and Goomba again. He hit a cactus in the final lap, and still pulled out a top twenty time despite a cactus hit. <laughs> 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 the cactus loses you over a second, I believe. Yeah. So just ridiculous. Um, but then it was was it four three at that point? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the last track was Mushroom City, a track uh, which Goomba actually did a one try world record on in this year. So yeah, like a month he was and always going to win that one. Uh, <laughs> Probably. So it was five three in the end. But all in all, it's a good showing. Uh, yeah, and I think it was. I I, I gotta agree. It was the first time I heard speed run. Yeah, at, at, at Twitch, I know speedrun.com from like t almost ten years ago. It feels like exactly but the Twitch channel. Uh, I I feel like I would have heard about it because speedrun must be a coveted 
the Twitch uh, the channel name. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I was shocked. So, do you, did you guys know about this, uh, Joe or uh, Ryan? No, I never heard. Yeah. Of it. Well, I, I I know somewhat of the story behind Twitch TV slash Speedrun. Mm -hmm. I, I know Pack, the owner of Speedrun .com, acquired it. I don't know exactly how, um, but he has been known to you know, shell out a good deal of money to get these, you know, highly coveted domains and names and whatnot, like he did for speedrun.com. So he right. somehow found a way to get twitch.tv slash speedrun, and they've been using it now in, in all these tournaments and stuff, which is really cool. So Definitely. how long has that channel been active? I, I've been missing out. It's It's only been a few, like, weeks or months now. Yeah, he's kind of heavily involved with this... <laughs> There are a bunch of like different speedrunning sort of initiatives, tournaments, stuff like that going on. Um, like a couple, you know, Big John is a popular streamer who tries to run some tournaments, tries to run some events. Um, there's another guy called Speedrunners League who just kind of puts up yep, money. Yeah. Um, and That's then there's, great, by the way, yeah, definitely. And you know, he just kind of makes, he just says like, here's you know, hundred bucks or two hundred bucks to whoever wins this race, whatever. And then there's the Global Speedrun Association. And I know Cheese 05 Mario 64 runner is involved with that one uh, to a large extent. And they're the ones who are tied in with the speedrun Twitch account, as far as I know. So I'm just going to have a guess there. Is this like the the rise of uh, speedrunning going esports? It is hard to say. I mean, obviously, speedrunning is never going to be at a point where. You have, you know, Epic Games putting in a hundred million dollars no, prize no. pools. Okay, but at the same time, it's okay. Clearly, you know, there's professional sports like the NFL and like, um, you know, a European soccer and all this kind of stuff that has a lot of money. And there are other professional sports that don't have as much money involved, right? But they're still professional sports. So, I mean, is it is it really esports? It probably is, depending on your wide enough definition of esports. If you know, if you just want to say it's competing at video games, well, then yes, yeah, speedrunning is sort of already esports, right? Um, but you know, it's just not kind of seen in the same light. But maybe these kind of right. tournaments will will begin that, yeah. Yeah, because matches are quite a bit more uh, enticing to watch than one, uh, one guy playing time trial or, or speedrunning something ad infinitum. Especially with added commentary from uh, dedicated sure. casters, it makes a, a big difference, in my opinion. Yeah, I'd say like the professionalism surrounding it and the monetary aspect probably would be the my definition of what esports would be considered. Yeah, yeah. kind of funny thing is that like sometimes you'll be watching or you'll see a clip of some esport tournament, and it just looks way too like overproduced and too serious, and it kind of makes you like not want to watch it. You know, kind of. This is true. Whereas, like, some kind of more, how do you put it, um, with the term organic, homemade... Gra grassroots. Yeah, yeah they, these can kind of feel more authentic, right? But, I mean, you know, maybe that's just kind of a uh, a, a bad argument for it, but uh, that's the way I see it sometimes, yeah. Well, there's a I mean, that's charm been... to it, but it's smaller scale, you know? <laughs> you kind of lose that charm when it's, it's, it's a giant production. Well, it's like, you know, people really liked AGDQ back before it was, um, you know, yeah. years ago, and it was a big different story. So mm -hmm. now it's a bit overproduced, I think a lot of people would say. Yes, I think I that's a good example, because I used to I watch agree the with that, fuck out of speedruns and GDQs back in the day, but now it's just okay. Yeah, they kind of turned a corner in like 2015, I'd say. That's kind of where it kind of, like when they started renting out giant halls, as opposed to like one room, you know. Yeah, it, it went. Uh, it went a place not everyone wanted to follow, I guess. But sure. bigger, bigger audience, probably more successful in that way. So mm -hmm. good for that. Well, I mean, the interesting thing, and I don't know if you guys want to get sidetracked too much with GDQ here, but the most recent event, SGDQ 2018, actually had a somewhat smaller audience than the previous few events. Yeah, like, I have. I have noticed the slowdown in growth. Are you talking about Twitch audience or uh, on the venue audience there? Twitch, uh, like like no, right. total number of viewers on Twitch, and the thing is, they still raised more money. So right. it's like, from an organizational standpoint, maybe they've just got rid of you know viewers who weren't going to donate, but they are losing viewers, and that's 
an interesting thing to watch over the next couple events for sure. Is Definitely. it an intentional scale back, or do you just think like people are just losing interest because of how big it's gotten? Well, I think partly people are losing interest. I think a large part of it is um, that Fortnite is so popular; it's taking viewers from every corner of gaming around the world, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think they pull a lot of viewers away from GDQ, and obviously, it could be a combination of things. People might just be getting tired of it as well. Yeah, the saturation probably the saturation. Is happening, Absolutely. and uh, of course, all the the, the very best games, the most compelling games, have been played to death. So now you're bringing in your new games, which may not as be as enticing to the viewers. It's it's true. And I mean, I never see a problem, though, with playing the most popular games to death. And I was oh, me up, neither, actually. You know, Mario Maker I was... is an example, right? I would watch mm -hmm. Mario Maker every time it's, right, yeah, every time it's on AGDQ. I would watch this. Yeah. Well, that, exactly right, and you know, as long as you have a good run or you know, ocarina of time, I'd watch it every every month, right? There's a reason uh, I I use the example of you know the Academy Awards always has the same categories. They don't try to change the categories every year, right. or the, <laughs> the, the 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 Masters Golf Tournament is on the same course every year. People love it, right? So, I think people do like this kind of consistency, and I think that's a big something that the organizers of GDQ don't quite understand for sure. Yeah, I would say they're also kind of getting pretty gimmick heavy with their runs at some at some points. Like blindfolded runs were a thing for like punch out and stuff, but like now you have to do something crazy if you want to have your game accepted at all. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. it's no longer been or it's it's no longer the same thing where it was like just have a good runner running a a, a game. It's now it's like, well, what else do you do with the game? It's like, well, I don't I don't know. <laughs> and then they just, they say, well, you're you're declined. Then it's like well, that sucks. No, it's so, true. Having said that though, some of the gimmicks are still. Really, really. Some of really them are cool. fun, like, but sometimes like, like the, it what jumps TMR to did at ESA. I don't know if you've seen this. The blindfold tunnel in uh, what's it called? Super oh Mario yeah. Ghosts. Holy. No, no. <laughs> Battletoads, right? Battletoads. Uh, sorry, yeah, Battletoads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's impressive. But like now, it's kind of like if you want to have your game accepted, you have to have like something like ancillary on the side that you also do to make it interesting. But I think just a run itself would be interesting. Right. I always used to think GDQ was too far on the conservative side. Just wanted strict speed runs, no two-player stuff, no uh, competition. And then I, f I f almost feel like the Mario Kart Double Dash, uh, Andreas Rudmarker versus Richard Carlson, was it? Mm -hmm. I feel like that was kind of the eye-opener there. The uh, the all-cops run that went down to the last second or something. Yeah, that was at ESA, but yeah, I see what you mean. Oh right, yeah. yeah but some other people did a Mario Kart run at a GDQ where it was down to the final second. I can't remember who that was though. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> yeah, hashtag stays for charity. <laughs> I can't, still can't believe when I watched that back, Harold, that you lost in the end. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. Yeah, you had that right. one. Don't mention the war. <laughs> it's still Don't an open wound. <laughs> no, it's not actually. It's. Uh, I really would have taken this result. Over a five-second win, any day. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So much more sure. memorable this way. Sure. Yeah. All right. Should we try moving on a little bit? Uh, yeah. The world of SMK. Just get that out of the way, so Goose can participate. I don't know, R Ryan. What's your take on SMK? By the way, it, it's one of those. How do I put? It? I'm I'm Mario Kart 64 or or nothing. Right. That's the one yeah. I know. That's when I played. A little bit. I can kind of follow a little bit of Double Dash. I play that too, but. Super Mario Kart's just a little bit before my time. I don't know much about it. Right. Okay. So no video then. Um, not unless like, well, uh, you know, um, I can do a video on anything if it's if there's something interesting enough. But uh, I don't know. I haven't heard of of too many crazy stories from it recently. Well, one, well, there there is one world record in Super Mario Kart that doesn't have a video. <laughs> which 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 one is this? Uh, so it's Ghost Valley one uh, fast lap. Actually, there's think... more. Sorry, the, yeah, there's, there's one. Sorry, one more, oh, uh, no, Bowser Castle. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. Bowser Castle. Yeah. I swear, someone messaged me about this at one point. I think. <laughs> oh really? A, a, a lot of people will message me stuff that's like, yeah, that and like people will just send me you know emails or Twitter DMs telling me of a story they think would be interesting to cover. And, you know, a lot of times I say, okay, thanks, but, like, you know, it's, yeah. I don't know too much about it, whatever. Um, but I, I swear this one, may, I'll, I'll try to see, you know, while you guys are talking what this person said, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's one of mine, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's Carol's flap, and it, 
Well, it's old, right? It's like super old. It's like 12 yeah, years two, old, I think. 2006. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you did used to have videos at that time, although it was yeah, shaky, so like, and potato you know, cam, black well, and once, white. Once again, I can tell you what happened. I had one means of recording, so it was a single point of failure setup. And yeah. that involved a webcam, which requires a PC. And that week, well, I don't know, even know how long it lasted, but my parents' computer was broken, the hard drive was busted. So I had to wait until like it would get replaced. And I happened to get the lab that week or that period. And you that's just the end happened of the story. to get it. Convenient, <laughs> huh? You got one of the most unbreakable records in Super Mario Kart. <laughs> I didn't know that when I did it. Right? That's probably true. So uh, let me just do the segue thing that I hate so much. So there's so not, Carol, not much of a story there, actually. So. No, no, no. <laughs> not much of a lore, if you will. No, definitely not. But uh, people have been trying to go after it, and it's just not happening, right? Uh, I will tie it one day. Right. Just have a video. Hopefully. Yeah. People have been happen. going for it, but it's uh, it's it's proving to be a tall order for certain people. It'll happen. That shall remain nameless. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, a world record that is on video, Carol. Uh, this week's Mario Circuit Three. I guess you're yeah. talking about that one. Yes, um, yes. I went after the uh, Mario Circuit 3 world record because I wanted to do a Pell system world record this year, which I had not done yet. And uh, without being inconsiderate, I think the Mario Circuit 3 one is probably the low-hanging fruit. As far as you can tell, any world record uh, that it's a low-hanging fruit because it did not have the optimized strat in all of the laps. So Scoop had a 126.74, with four out of five by boosts and i figured if i would just get five out of five by boosts which is still a tall order because you need to hit the pipe in a specific very finicky way uh, which is hard to do but once i did it once i expected to get the world record and i actually did a five five and did not get the world record i got a 127.04 because my driving was not up to scratch mm. so it's a little bit embarrassing but I actually pushed it a bit more, and then I hit another 5.5, five, which was a couple of tenths faster than the world record at 126.48. Um, so that's the only world record driven this week in SMK, I believe. So yeah, got my 2018 Pell world recce. So uh, <laughs> I can now switch to NTSC season, maybe. Maybe go for a certain record that was aforementioned earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No Let pressure. Me just... <laughs> <laughs> Let me just mention that I cringe up every time I hear the word recce. I, uh, oh, I have right. issues. <laughs> anyway, so how was the how was the five lap? Uh, you, I think someone said it could go down another half a second. Oh yeah, one twenty five is uh, I feel inevitable. Um, once someone actually hits nice driving in combination with five 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 pit, like what my race had going for it was the five 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 pit. And every successful pipe hit wins about, I would say, twenty five hundreds. Wow. Okay. Maybe even maybe even three tenths. And Sami has one twenty six ninety eight without any. So cutting a full second is very feasible. Oh. Uh, right. Obviously. Uh, having said that, it's a hard track to be consistent on and I at least am not going to push it further. I was just in there for the world record basically. Um, and if other people would pursue it like Scoop. I think could hit 125 if you tried. Uh, I could do it too if I tried, uh, and it's it's gonna happen one day, I'm sure. But it's a bit of a trash, NBT track. It's not the best track. That's the thing. I don't want to dedicate any more time to it than strictly necessary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Fair enough. Um, we have a bit more of SMK news. I guess we should give the biggest of shoutouts to Scow B or <laughs> <laughs> Scoob for uploading tons of Super Mario Kart footage from the World Championship. I, I believe he has done all four finals, grand finals. Yeah. Uh, all of Matt, uh, all of battle mode. Mm -hmm. And he is currently uploading match race, or is he done with that too? He is in the process of. Uh... Uploading match race, I believe. Yeah. So probably by the time this episode goes live, all of the recorded matches from uh, the World Championships will be up on YouTube. There's a ton of work. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Well, and there's a one, one small footnote to add to that as well, is that Scoop was actually uh, being interrupted in his uploads of battle mode videos because of the weather again. So he uses his 4G oh, wow. connection, which is sensitive to thunderstorms, apparently. <laughs> so <laughs> he had to skip a day of or a night of uploading because of uh, thunderstorms in France. So <laughs> shout outs to 4G. <laughs> Still, still all that shit, huh? Yeah, I don't understand either, but yeah. Uh, and speaking of CDM, uh, Joe, did you know that we have the next world's winner of CDM in this uh, conversation? We do. I'm not familiar. Well, uh, Carol has started something he calls Project Timmy 2.0. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the first, I believe, the first non-secretive uh, CDM practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. All the top players in Super Mario Kart claim to never practice Super Mario uh, Kart for CDM. I'm sure. Well, Mio and Sami specifically. Scoop is a little less. Uh, right. Of yeah. It's it. That's true. Uh, so. Well, Carol, you can talk about it yourself, but Carol and LaFongo are now doing sort of a... Training sessions. <laughs> yes. Well, they, they already were, I guess, but those were secretive. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, like, LaFongo moved into our house, the house of gaming, uh, like two months before CDM, on um, which one month he was on holidays. So, but then he wanted to, like, practice with me in SMK without the world knowing, so that he would be, like, suddenly from scrub to, you know actually decent at the game um, maybe win that most which, improved title <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah. the Meriti award which he did end up winning yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's why one of the conditions like if we were gonna practice like don't stream it and don't tell anyone it's like okay I'm fine with that but we need a secret code name for the project <laughs> to refer to <laughs> so we called project Timmy Timmy is my cat uh, <laughs> I believe the acronym stands for something too but I forgot what it was the M probably stands for Mario Kart and T for training, but I don't remember the rest. <laughs> it's all about anyway, the cat. Yeah, it's all about the cat, exactly. Which is now also a logo in my stream overlay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So there's been a bit of a hiatus now. And also, you're streaming on uh, SMK underscore machine and yes. La Fungo's channel? Yeah, so we alternate. We feel that's the fair thing to do. Uh, so one one night we'll stream on my channel and the next we'll stream on his. And we try to go through all the modes and then the aim is to play at least once a Well, not at least. The aim is to play once a week on average. Uh, this week we failed. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we can, we can get it back on track next week. Oh, sure you will. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, any other news or topics we want to touch on before we uh, pester Gooser with, the, with some conversational chat i want to talk about those crazy unties by carl yes. jobs and goldeneye Jeez. sure th yeah. that does go into the topic of goose i guess uh, yeah what happened there i mean which one in particular do you want to start with <laughs> how about damn well, 52 <laughs> well damn 52 was pretty I, I i do have a 20 minute long video explaining everything that went to damn 52 that was pretty insane Really, it just it came down to a matter of will, and it, it's one of those things where we knew back in the day, even in 2005, you could get 53 with zero boosts and 1.2 control style. So with three boosts, plus starting in 2.x control style, which saves a third of a second, the math's all there. It was just a matter of going out and doing it, so pretty crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. That, that kind of, to me, that kind of sounds like 53 without boost and 1.x is just as hard as 52? It very well might be. Um, I wouldn't say quite exactly well, as no, hard, no. but like it, it's like it's it's pretty good. Yeah, pretty insane. So who did that? Dan Cervone, who oh. peaked at second place or second or third place. And he played like 2004, 2006 or so. And he was really, really good at the game and got a few untied. Oh, that's the man with the most beautiful movement uh, when I watched Goldeneye. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. He, like, man, I mean, and he's like a genius, right? I, I, I mentioned him in the last Speed Lore episode. He, um, 
you know, went to Harvard. He's like an intense mathematician. He's been published in all these articles. You know, he works for a pro sports team now. So like he obviously went on to much bigger and brighter things, but like, this is a guy who's just super talented all around. Yeah, and, yeah. uh, when it comes to speed running, it's, it's no exception. Right. Uh, well, we probably don't want to spend too much time talking about each of the untieds you've uh, <laughs> covered in the speed lore videos and whatnot. But I just do... want to know, because I don't think that part was covered, but do we have a ballpark figure on how many hours for each untied he spent? Or does he know, or does anyone roughly know? I think he would roughly know, but I don't necessarily have it. I don't think he played like 100 hours for the okay. Bunker 116. I think it was less. He's very intentful on his play now. Like, he figures out something, he sees it, and he goes for it. And it, it, it usually comes relatively quick like damp 52 was a year-long thing for him but all the other untieds like they're pretty efficient yeah right so, important <laughs> speaking from experience too yeah yeah so is that what sets him apart from other players now i mean other players are probably just as good or whatever but he sets his eyes on these untieds and just goes for them and succeeds it seems yeah his approach is just very different i mean he really one thing I've been thinking about recently and maybe doing a video on is like, who are the five gods of Goldeneye? You know, it's, it, this is a, a term used in Smash Brothers Melee, the five gods of Melee. Oh, and, I have to, I have to quickly disagree. I think that term is from Street Fighter back in early oh, it, 2000. Well, it, no, it, it, it is, of course. And it's a bore, it's a borrowed term. Oh, but it's right. Most, yeah. Okay. It's, it's most well known through, through Melee now. And so I was thinking, who are these guys, right? And right now, I would say it's probably, um, you know, David Clemens, Mark Rutsu, Perfect Ace, Big Boss Man, and I, I'd have to say Carl Jobs now, certainly. Yeah. And th those other four guys, I would say, have the same or more skill as Carl. I think even Carl knows that Ace is, like, a, by far the most skilled player. But Carl's approach is just so different and a guy like Clemens, um, he's kind of a funny guy because um, like sometimes he'll come up with the strategy and, and, and figure out and go for it. But like it, it just feels like Carl is so intentful with it. Like he will make it happen no matter what and find the path forward. Yeah, I think after those uh, I mean even after Dam fifty two, he would almost already be on that list for me personally as an outsider. But with all three of those, uh over a hundred people on died. Yeah. <laughs> he has to be. <laughs> no, it, it, it's absolutely insane. And like the thing is, then where do you categorize someone like a Wouter Jansen who right. has the most records mm -hmm. ever in history? Um, and mind you, his last untied was in two thousand five, right? So maybe you put him as you know an old god or or some. But I mean, I think you could make these kind of classifications and make it pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, honorable mentions, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know, d demigods, ancient religions, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, you could have fun with it. <laughs> yeah, it, it is kind of fun like that. For uh, So I've been kind of gone from the N64 game scene for like 10 years. So we did this show, this uh, Carthritis cart radio show back in 2008. And back then, for me, it was uh, Walter Janssen and uh, Brian Bossard. Those were like the two in Goldeneye. And I was probably not the uh, the most nuanced impression, but uh, that's kind of the thing I got out of the rankings, that those were the two. So that's no longer the case. Walter's been bopped, as you say. Very, very, very much so. And, and like, you know, Carl's most recent untied, Bunker 116. Yeah. The 17 was set by Wouter. Now there's only one record left in the rankings that Wouter originally set, Frigate Agent 23. And so if that one goes, then his entire legacy, in a sense, uh, has been erased from the leaderboards. Man. And what is interesting, though, is that now there's a new strategy on the Cradle level. And, yeah, we and right. Wouter all of a sudden is back in action playing Cradle. And wow. He actually just... As this show, as this podcast started, he lowered his PB on Cradle Double O Agent from thirty-seven to thirty-four. Jeez. He got the world record, and now if he can get thirty-three, it'd be like it would be unbelievable if he could get an untied thirteen years later. You know, after his last one, <laughs> definitely 
13 years between world records. Yeah. And, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and now what has happened before this guy, uh, Randy Buikima is a player. I think he went 14 years between untieds, actually. He got a couple on runway double agents in 2016. But the thing is, and, and, and it's a pretty big deal because Randy was a former dual champion, Perfect Dark and Gold Knight. He was a legendary player. But like Wouter's even more legendary. So if Wouter can do it, it's going to be unbelievable. So did he come back just for this cradle uh, strategy development, or I think largely, but Wouter's kind of always been around. He just doesn't really play very often. I guess this new thing just kind of inspired him to go and play and go for it. Can you put it in layman's terms what the new thing is? Okay, so if you're familiar with the cradle level, uh, pretty much everyone who's played the game is familiar with, you know, you run the cradle, you chase Trevelyan around, and you um, run to the end, okay? Sure. But the strategy involved, like the previous strategy involved, if you shot out the drone, in there, there's a room Trevelyan runs into, activates a console, there's a drone in that room. If you shoot at the drone, it blows up in a fire explosion. If you shoot Trevelyan on the same frame that the explosion damages him, he will die. Now there's two possible frames per run to do that on but it's still pretty inconsistent. They're like 15 frames apart. So it, it's mostly luck. It's not something that can really be timed. It's just a matter of doing a bunch of runs and hoping it happens. So you, we would kill him like that and then go to the left side of that hut console room, blow up the console ourselves and run to the end. Recently, it was discovered that Trevelyan 30% of the time when he dies will drop a grenade. And that grenade, a certain small percent of the time, Will like bounce in the right spot that it blows up the console itself so you can just skip going to the left side of the room and blowing up the console you can just run straight to the end after killing him and that saves the one second to make 33 possible so what i got from that is you said it was recently discovered uh that is a 30 percent chance this is like two or three days ago yeah i i just i i guess i assumed uh the tech gurus of Goldeneye would know the drop rates of stuff like that, because there's like a grenade drop earlier on in Cradle, right? Well, it, it's it's one of those things, and well, the other grenade drops that were used even in older strategies, they're much lower than 30% of the time, far lower. So this one, like, all the pieces were there, we just didn't put it together, because we get a little bit complacent, you know? That's all it comes down to. Right. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. I remember there's like uh, this, uh, what is it called? Dark LTK silo run, which requires like three grenade drops or four. Yeah, but the thing with DLTK is because each time a guard like takes damage and then reacts, there's a new chance to pull a grenade. Right. And so since they take he 10 headshots to kill, each guard has like a 10 times greater chance to pull a grenade in a sense. So it's not like as absurd. Okay. Well, it's dark not... LTK is absurd yeah. in other ways. Yeah, just, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the hardest level to beat dark LTK streets? Silo was the last one to be beaten. Yeah. Because, Silo was the last one to be beaten. Oh, wow, yeah. Because Silo has a timer on it, 8 minutes and 30 seconds. And so most LTK, DLTK levels, the first time they were beat, took like 20 minutes or 40 minutes, and then slowly got refined down. Right, yeah. But on Silo, we never had that luxury. It was either beat it in eight and a half minutes or nothing. Am I wrong in thinking that when it got beaten, it was uh, more than eight and a half minutes? It was slightly more because you... Okay, so the intro cutscene on Silo is like 15 seconds long or something. So if you skip those two cutscenes the timer doesn't start counting down until like six or seven or eight seconds later. So you'll actually have like 838. And then you could skip, you could have like one or two seconds after like the full first pulse of the explosion and survive, I think. So it's like you could get like an 839, 840. And I think 839 was the original time, actually. <laughs> right. That's How many people crazy. have actually completed Silo Dark LTK now? Not I'm, many. I'm pretty sure it's three. I can double check here in a second. All right. Still very hard. They're all but really hard. <laughs> but I, I guess it's a, it's a very niche corner in the community, perhaps. Or is it, it actually quite competitive still? It's four people now who have completed it. And yes, Boson's first completion was 831. <laughs> so just one second over. 
Um, it, it is pretty niche. It has much, like, when you consider the amount of competition compared to the, you know, main levels in Golden Knight, it's so much less competition. Right. But it's the same skilled players doing a lot of it, right? So it, yeah. the overall skill of the records isn't that much lower, um, but, you know, it, it's not quite the same for sure. It's the same situation with Super Mario Kart between like time trial and Grand Prix runs. It's the, it's the same players doing it, so the skill level is still quite comparable, but just the amount of effort going into it is is more serious in time trial, even though it's, it's getting closer. Yeah, it's a slightly different game. Well, not game, obviously, but the Paul NTSC difference is sort of to me the same as uh, time trial versus Grand Prix. Right. Oh. All the cornering is different, the speed is different, and then you have the items, the CPUs, yeah. Yeah, but basically the the specialists uh, are uh, on both sides. Let's sure, say. yeah. Although this uh, this Boson guy, is that the name? Yep, Adam Boson, yep. Uh, he's sort of a dark LTK specialist, right? He is, but he's also had a lot of like crazy untied world records in the main GoldenEye stages, um, or just kind of unexpected records. So he's just a very like dark horse character who just shows up every now and then with something shocking. <laughs> well, that's a cool persona to have, to be honest. <laughs> but he hasn't spent that much time in the standard format game then. I think he has actually. You know, he's actually oh. PB'd pretty recently. Uh, August 2018, he got some Aztec PBs. So, you know, but okay, like, you know, bef that's his only two PBs this year. Last year, maybe eight PBs, nothing in 2016, three PBs in 2015. So he's an occasional player, but I, I think he did for a time put a lot of time into the main sequence, uh, you know, for a few years there. Yeah. Right. Moving on, some gold mine questions. Uh, yeah, this is gonna turn into a question, Goose. I'm afraid, but um, the gold mine gathering at GDQ next year. Have you given that any thought? Well, definitely. Now the thing is, like submissions for GDQ closed a couple days ago, and like we had this huge plan all along that we like, oh, really focus, really try to like all submit a race, whatever. And, you know, put a lot of effort into our submission and make cool videos and make sure it gets in. And, like, we ended up doing none of that. And so you wonder, is that just because we're lazy and, like, whatever? Or is it because we didn't really actually want to get into GDQ that much? We don't really care about it, you know? And, like, maybe that's more of the explanation. But the thing is, we are still going to meet up kind of at the event. Um, one of the guys has organized, like, renting out a house nearby. I think 16 or 20 of us are going to be there and then there'll be more people at the event itself. And we're going to, you know, we'll all be around the area at the time and have a big meetup and it'll be a lot of fun, regardless of whether or not anyone is playing gold Knight in the actual GDQ event. Yeah. It's a good enough excuse to get together and do something, I guess. Uh, going to watch the GDQ is sort of enough on its own, but have you ever had like a big gold Knight meeting in the past? Uh, except for the uh, Virginia meets. Well, you have the Virginia ones, and then at GDQ 2015, we had a, you know 20 people, and it was it was a good time, maybe 30 people. I think that was the biggest meeting of elitists at a GDQ. So this one hopefully is is going to be bigger and and better and more fun. Yeah. So uh, elitists going to GDQ has been a thing in the past, like all the years with spikes in 2015 and the next year. I would say 2014, we had, you know, some leaders, some Carters. We had a good time there, maybe 10 or 12 of us. 2015 was the most. 2016 went back down again. And then pretty much every GDQ, there's a few leaders who end up going, but not any kind of huge community meet with like 20 or 30 or more people. How many do you think are going this time? I think it might end up being like, yeah, 30 or 40, I would say. Wow. It's a nice number. <laughs> it's huge, yeah. <laughs> it will, I mean, we'll see, right? Because I, you know, obviously the house has a limited capacity. So hope, you know, and you know how gamers are, right? Some people don't understand these types of things. So we're hoping that there's no one um, 
<laughs> who kind of, you, you, you know, style, you, mean. <laughs> you know how things go at these, when there's a lot of socially unaware gamers around, right? Things can go <laughs> poorly at times. Yes. So hopefully everyone either is, you know, allowed to be in the house or has another place to stay, like the hotel room and everything goes smoothly. But you are definitely going to this. Or don't I mean, as as definite, like I, that's what I always say, right? Like, yeah, I'm definitely going, but like, you know, something crazy could happen that prevents me from going. But like, I'm planning on going right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barring any unforeseen circumstances, is what I always say. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So there is an elephant in the room, and I'll try my darnest to make a very slow segue there. Um, for the. Uh, meeting you're doing at gdq are, are are you just talking like high fives and some casuals or do you guys plan on having a tournament or one tries or is there anything like that going on we don't really do stuff like that that much um i think I don't, you know maybe you guys won't have seen any of it but last year we met up four of us in kansas city for the solar eclipse and unfortunately at that at that meeting it was sort of an excuse like one of the guys graviton who's a pretty new leader he has the uh, runway double agent on tides wait is that the uh, pilot wings expert correct yep he's pilot yeah. wings as well yep and uh so he's like hey like the solar eclipse is coming right over our house who wants to come hang out play video games for a weekend and and, and see it and so i went there with david clemens and brian bosshart big boss man so it was four of us and yeah, we played Mario Party, uh, Grav taught Doom to Clemens, but mostly we were just like hanging out in the room playing our single level Goldeneye stuff, going for records. And I was trying to play Silo Secret Agent. I got some pretty, cl I almost got the world record a couple times there. So it was like stuff like that. It's kind of fun to have like three or four guys hanging out in the room and you're all trying to get a world record. Like, kind of in front of each other right and if that happens that's really amazing and really cool so like, that's that's mostly what we go for you know i understand that the early super mario card meets were exactly like that yeah i just that's what we do like time trial so that's what you do when you meet as well at first at least so yeah exactly totally and you know there's that. there's going to be a lot of other random gaming a lot of you know i'm sure mario party i'm sure mario kart but like i think that's what sort of the main challenge is going to be people trying to beat their PBs and get world records. But I guess what we want to know is if there's any streamed content going to be coming from this meeting. Potentially. That, that is a good question. I don't know for sure. Um, I know there's sort of a, or there was a rule at HDQ, I don't know if it's the same recently, that you can't stream from the hotel because right. they don't want everyone using yeah. the hotel internet, etc. Yeah. Okay, but since we're in a different house, it might be possible to happen, right? So I, I don't know. I haven't been involved in organizing that yet. That's just sort of a an, uh, sort of an old thing from the Mario Kart community that when there are meetings, you know, back in the day, people didn't use to stream anyway. But I always wanted to see what's going on, on in those meetings, even back in like 2004 and stuff, the first one I heard about. Uh, so yeah, even if it's just people going for world records, the the mood in the room and the chat and everything, it's a it's a thing to behold. I mean, I would definitely want to watch that, even though I'm no Goldeneye guy. Yeah, no, it'd be like someone like me. It's okay. I haven't been streaming, doing speedruns like for half a year now, but in that sort of atmosphere, I I totally would. Right, you're kind of in that zone. You're just playing games for a week. I would totally start to stream and just hang out and chat with chat as well as the people in the room. And that might be a pretty cool, uh, a window into it. And I, I definitely plan on like making, you know, kind of vlog type of videos while I'm there as well, kind of showing what's going on and talking to people and whatnot. Yeah, that's cool. Vlogs. That's one of my least favorite words, I believe after. <laughs> well, just Probably. nowadays it, they're so heavily connotated with like, you know, the YouTubers like Jake Paul and, and that kind of crap. Right. So it's like, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to associate with that kind of vlogging lifestyle. <laughs> but it's, right. That, that right. is what it is, right? Cringy at best. <laughs> Quite. Uh, right. So there have been talks about, I mean, I don't know about you, Carol, but I've at least spoken to some of the European Goldeneye players, or I should call them leaders, I guess. Uh, 
-hmm. uh, who are considering going to the TDQ meeting. Yeah. Because this is going to be like the big one, is the word on the streets, so to speak. And uh, all these people are, I mean, good speedrunners of Goldeneye, but m more known to me, at least, as uh, exceptionally good multiplayer players. Yeah. yeah. I think you're mostly well, talking about Patrick Vessels and Isis Smith, right? Uh, Illu. Um, Illu, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, but Illu is also, for me, is also very much a speedrunner. Oh, more sure. So, but, more so yeah. than ISM Patrick, in my opinion. But yeah. Yeah, fair enough. I don't actually know how Ice and Illu are ranked, but they are. The times I've watched them play multiplayer or speedrun, it's uh, a sight to behold, surely. Absolutely. So, uh, Goose, can you uh, shed some light on the state of multiplayer Goldeneye over in the big country? You know, I, I honestly don't know too much about multiplayer at all. It just. When I grew up, I never really had any competent person to play against, so I never got good at multiplayer. The only person I had to play video games with, um, you know, when I was like 12, 10, was my cousin who is, um, uh, you know, we'll say a bit slow, right? He's not very good at the video games, that kind of stuff. So <laughs> if we ever played multiplayer, I would just destroy him because, you know, so I never got good. So I never learned how to play. And as a result, I just don't really care about the multiplayer scene. Um, I know, I think Carl Jobst, though, he you know famously came second place to Clemens at maybe Virginia 2012 or 2011, somewhere in there. And that was kind of the last huge meeting between Titans uh, of multiplayer. And I think Carl and Clemens would love to have a rematch sometime. Um, whether that happens at GDQ, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I haven't been following it too much, yeah. All right, I I find the multiplayer quite interesting, uh, and I think I think Patrick Nilsson won uh, Virginia Meet as well when he went several times, I believe. For, several times. Nilsson's probably won, yeah, a few times. I mean, he the thing with Nilsson is he's like a traveler by nature, right? Like he's you know he lives the most the life of the most interesting man in the world. Yeah, yeah, he's just so. like a connoisseur of luxury. I think so, he's in Amsterdam right now, but he might already be gone again. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. So, so for him, it's nothing to go to America for for a week, right? Right. Um, whereas the other Europeans, it's much more of an unusual effort for them. True. Sure. No. No, I, I'm just curious how the very top players would rank in multiplayer because that's kind of never really happened, has it? I mean, we had the European meetings. Uh, NLG 07 was. Something and yeah, that had Ilu, uh, Patrick Nielsen, uh, Patrick Vessels. Um, who else am I forgetting now? <laughs> well, Steve, oh, Isa, obviously. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I was, so. say Isa was probably there. Yeah, Isa did Isa won it actually. No, in 2007, no. Oh, I mean the free for all, the four player free for all, but the, uh, oh, yeah, the right. 1v1, which admittedly doesn't really work in Golden I think three players better. I think that's what the uh, Virginia guys also ended up concluding. But the one versus one was won by Patrick Nielsen. Uh, I remember. In the final against uh, Ilu. This is 2008. I'm uh, talking about 2012. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, we did it three times. Okay. Yeah, because right. that, that one had the most uh, GoldenEye multiplayer specialists uh, there. Yeah, not true. I'm suffering from cart mensch at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so uh, we kind of thought Patrick Wessels or even Steven Swartz when he played in 2007, because he, he beat Patrick, but then after that, Patrick kept on beating Illu every time yeah. they met. Yeah. And then kind of Patrick Nielsen uh, cemented his spot in the first place after 2012. Indeed. And also, I believe Isa lived with uh, Patrick Wessels for... A bit. Yeah, like a year when he was doing an internship in Amsterdam. Yeah, and then they used to play multiplayer a bit? Yeah, I was there. I live in the same house. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Was I was basically target practice for those guys. And uh, we played a lot of three-player. And it mostly ended up with both of those guys chasing me to get kills. Because they were <laughs> obviously rushing to get like first to ten kills or whatnot. 
And I was getting better because of it. Because I, I had more um, chances to kill opponents because they were constantly flooding to me, right? <laughs> so in the end, I was almost getting close to their scores, but still the skill gap was quite there. I know, I know that feeling, by the way, when you guys played Goldeneye uh, in the practice room at SGDQ 2016. I was just... It was like a bully campaign. I was just like, God damn. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like a and punching Patrick bag. Vessels, Patrick Vessels is the worst because he goes for spawn kills too and stuff. It's, yeah, it's yeah. disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I kind of lost a little patience with that. I was like, I'll just spin in a circle yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, I still enjoy doing it because I, uh, I love myself some golden eye. But yeah, I'm just not good yeah. at it. No, I'm terrible at it. Awful. One of the worst. <laughs> but from that year of getting pummeled, Carol, uh, you... <laughs> kind of concluded that Isa was a notch above Yeah, Wessels, that was, was basically uh, Isa won pretty much 90% of the matches we played. Yeah. Right. I, th I think the sort of going list of the best players is like Isa Smith, maybe Patrick Nil is, is Nilsson supposed to be better than Wessels? Yeah, I think Nilsson is actually better than Isa, but Isa won yeah. last year but so, yeah. Nilsson is more like the favorite out of okay. those so I think like the best players are like Patrick Nilsson, Isa Smith, Carl Jobst, and David Clemens, and maybe Jimbo is sort of close to them. But like those are the best guys. Yeah, and Ilu and Patrick Vessels are like within overlapping skill sets. But oh not wow! Well, I mean, Patrick Nilsson and Isa are better than Patrick Vessels and and and, and um, Ilu, but yeah. uh, it's not unthinkable that one of them wins, let's say. I think Ilu on a good day could beat Patrick Nielsen, for example. No, 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 sure, sure, no. I mean, I shouldn't have sounded so shocked, but like Ilu, Ilu is good at a lot of games he plays, for sure. I mean, Ilu actually had one of the first Super Mario 64 16 star <laughs> world records. Right. And it has like two or three million views back before there was no speedrunning content on YouTube, yeah. Actually, let me derail for a second there. Um, I have a video of Ilu from 2008 <laughs> at the, uh, the Next Level Gaming Meet in Norway. I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, the video you're talking about, Ryan, is from 2005, I believe. Yeah, sounds right. 16-star uh, world record, around 20 minutes, something. Uh, and the time yeah. drop dropped a lot after that because more people got into the scene. Let me just name drop Miles Buckrim while I'm at it, and uh, <laughs> let's not think about that anymore. <laughs> so uh, Ilu lost the world record sometime between 2005 and 2006, I guess. And in the 2008 meeting, he was uh, dead set on getting it back. Uh, I need to add to the story that he had just <laughs> just had a nice big old clunk of moonshine uh, <laughs> and he sat down all in the corner and he was going to play Super Mario 64 and the rest of us are like yeah sure we'll do this we'll play this game there's some double dash going on there's Mario Party Circuit Breakers of course whichever everyone's playing games and Elo is in the corner playing in Super Mario 64 and I don't have the start of this uh, captured on video but I have the middle uh, where Patrick Wessels takes the video camera and just films around the room. Uh, this is where Geo, the uh, Super Mario Kart legend, is playing poker and screaming all in, all in. <laughs> so Patrick is just going around filming everyone and saying hi and trying to flirt with uh, anything that's not male or not as much male. <laughs> not too picky of a guy. <laughs> And uh, suddenly, uh, Ilu appears outside. Uh, I mean, no. Uh, Patrick is looking for Ilu, and he goes outside, and then he hears him off in the distance, because this is when Ilu had spawned. So Ilu had faked being shot by Patrick's video camera, and then he decided to respawn, because he was in Goldeneye in his head. The respawn was over by the forest outside of the venue, so he kind of ran over there, and Patrick had to go outside, get him back inside. Ilu runs into a wall, uh, ends up on the floor. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, but then he gets back up on his feet, and he says, Patrick, Patrick, come, you got to look, you got to look. And then Ilu shows him the ending screen of Super Mario 64, and then he takes up the stopwatch, which says uh, 14 minutes and 5 seconds or something. 
And he claims to have uh, set a world record that night. I don't think he stands by that claim anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, t I spoke to him about this like two or three weeks ago whenever he was streaming a bit. And he said, oh yeah, that was a sign of things to come. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I vividly remember that moment because uh, uh, Ilu running right into the wall made quite of a, an impact. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. Was, because I was playing Mario tennis with Ulf. We were trying to beat the max difficulty setting of the computer together right. in uh, two versus two. And we were very into it and because it's very hard to beat the CPU at max. And then suddenly we heard this loud bang and uh, well, at first we heard someone running because obviously you would hear that, right? In, on a wooden floor. Yeah. And then boom, straight into the wall. We're like, whoa, what happened here? So yeah, I remember that vividly. World record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, those kind of moments of, of roaming around and just kind of raw footage of the environment at these meets is always so funny to look back on. Yeah. There's a lot of it from AGDQ 2015, which hasn't really seen like the surface of the day yet. People still have it on their hard drives and whatnot. A lot of like backroom stuff. Um, I'm sure some of you will know the um, famous 100 meter dash world record that happened there absolutely and so there's a lot more that was filmed like behind the scenes going into it and uh yeah i think that's all out there and there's kind of crazy memories to have you know kind of makes it feel like there's something really important really magical happening at these meets i was gonna mention that actually when we were talking about the atmosphere and vibe at these events how that 100 meter dash thing really was a window to how the HDQ atmosphere is backstage. Well, I remember being at that event and okay, I would say it's pretty much universal that the GDQs in 2013 were the last good ones. HDQ 2014 was still pretty decent, but had a bit of starting to fall off. And then SGDQ 2014 was a shit show. So we got to HDQ 2015 and you know, online people all oh, are so boring. There's no one in the room. The atmosphere sucks. And all week we're trying to figure out like how to, you know, amp it up, how to make something exciting. And this, I, I met that guy, Ari2929, and just kind of organically we meshed really well. We started the track and field just lead. And that's the thing, right? It's not, you know, oh, a, a one try tournament, a 1v1 tournament. It's just, hey, here's this game. Go for the record. And uh, it was it was really cool to see that progress over like two or three nights of people trying for the record there. I think the cash bounty was also pretty interesting as well. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, just, they, the, just the reactions, like the, the well, I hate using the word, but the hype being portrayed <laughs> by the performances being done was really interesting and enticing. And, and, and you know what the it, it was like you like. Some people were really into it, hanging out in that room for hours, like waiting for someone to get the record. It was insane. And other people were like kind of bothered. Like they're like, oh man, like these these crazy, you know, hundred people in this room, they're insane. I don't want to go in there tonight. <laughs> and the craziest thing about that run that people don't know is that the cameras that we had set up weren't filming the screen. So the footage you see of that run, literally one of my buddies, you know, one of the gold my buddies decided to just randomly to take out his phone and film like two or three runs at that moment. And it just so happens that the 941 record happened on one of those, on one of like the three runs he'd filmed. Otherwise we would have no footage at all of it. Eat your heart out, Usain Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> nine, four, imagine 941 in real life, man. That'd be pretty insane. Jesus. Yep. Quite. That's something, uh, this is uh, not relevant but i think we spoken about this before carol that the world records you see on the olympics yeah can't be the actual best times or longest throws or whatever from practice and everything like that yep i would so, venture a guess that usain bolt did nine fours in his life at some point i never seen him right? finish a, a finish a run at full speed exactly <laughs> it is possible but it's also possible that in training he never like put that much, you know. Yeah, that the much adrenaline Olympic. factor. It, 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 I've like okay, I, I grew up with uh, you know a lot of people who played a lot of sports growing up, and one person I know went to the Olympics uh, in 2012 and 2016, 
And they told me that, like, I, I, I asked her about it one time. I was like, how is it possible that these people are getting their absolute best runs at the Olympics? Mm-hmm. You know, like, as a speedrunner, I know, like, your best run can happen any time. Yeah. It doesn't happen under pressure at an event. And she told me that, like, it is crazy that it happens that way. But, like, in a sense, you are training four years for that exact moment to put out your absolute best run of any. And so that's why it happens there. Um, but I, I do. I think I know. Like in high jump, they'll often break records in practice that don't actually count. But it's yeah. hard to know for something like a running or a swimming if that's the case. Right. I would. I would just be interesting to hear from someone on the inside. But that's sort of what you're saying, though. That uh, yeah, they time their peak performance for the actual championship. I guess they don't really do time runs in training much. They just train specific parts of what leads up to the performance in the end. That's what I would guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. I'm, I'm sure there's like a whole world to dive in there and like dig up these athletes who have, you know, broken the records or personal vests in training and kind of learn more about it. It feels like almost it's an, uh, a silent agreement not to talk about it because yeah. it never comes up. And like maybe that's the way they want it to be. Exactly. I, it very well might be. I do know some world records uh, in the Olympics are beaten by means that are not uh, valid, like a different technique from the high jump or slightly different boots or whatever for the long jump, stuff like that has sort of a separate category that is completely not spoken about. But there are videos that show them, like the uh, the world records that don't count. No wow, way. that's very interesting. That's uh, something to quote unquote waste my time with on YouTube tonight. <laughs> You no, know, and I feel like it's sometimes there's like these areas of thought that maybe there's not very many YouTube videos made about it yet, right? So there's this whole potential untapped market of videos waiting to be made for people to waste thousands of hours watching. You know, I think this is one of those areas. Absolutely, right. So it's interesting that you're coming at this sort of from the because you said Ryan that you don't view your YouTube hours as wasted. And that's brilliant. I applaud you. I wish I could be as good of a guy <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> but you consider it sort of research then? Uh, everything well, it, is about growing the channel these days? Like, it, it's sort of like if you are a top athlete and you watch other people play the sport. Like, you're always... Like, yeah, you're kind of, like, sitting back and relaxing and and being entertained, but, like, you're still going to pick up things that are going to be valuable to you, right? Or, like, a film, let's say a a film director watching other movies. You know, they're still going to be learning about techniques and see what people did. So I I kind of view it the same way. This is how I watch football. Like, I play football as well, and when I watch a match, it's very relaxing, but at the same time, you learn stuff like how to solve difficult situations, like how do the top players do it and where do they move and that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. I can relate to um, watching hockey very similarly. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So as long as you're getting something out of it. I mean, the hours I spend on watching religious debates. uh, (laughs) Well, that's productive. (laughs) No, no. uh, What I pick up from it are the uh, philosophical points of view and like right. ways to think that I didn't necessarily have or have evolved as well as I should. So I, I do pick up stuff like that, which is useful in, you know, a fringe conversation once a year, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> At best. I also gotta I mean, say it's, it's nice to have another hockey fan in the uh, in the podcast for once because oh, I'm, I'm always on an island by myself over here. <laughs> You're a well, big is, sports there. guy, right? Very so. big sports guy, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I used to be a big sports guy, and then I just kind of got sick of, how do you put it, putting so much time and effort and money into something that you have no power over, right? It, it just, at, at one point, something clicked for me, and I, I stopped caring about it at the level I did. Like, in 2010-11, all I would do is wake up, you know, wait until the hockey games on the night, watch them all, follow it so closely, watch Sports Center. Like, that was my entire post about it online. That was it. And I just kind of got fed up. Like, I have no effect on this, right? Like, why am I so involved? 
Well, at least they're not engaging like, uh, like on Facebook, like in arguments over who's a better player in the team and stuff like that. Because I've seen a lot of those shit shows go down. <laughs> no, it, it, it is true. I mean, I, I probably did a little bit of that on uh, on some forums. I was posting a lot about sports on two plus two poker forums. I mean, I had a good time, ta- you know, and and made some buddies and whatnot. But uh, yeah, just get a little bit too involved, and then but at the same time, I was also coaching hockey, and so that's where I can kind of relate to watching you know watching you know professional hockey games and what i would notice is that a lot of the mistakes that you know kids would make 12 13 14 year old kids playing hockey would make are the same mistakes technically that even the pros make you know failing to get the puck out of the zone or or just you know just silly things like that and it kind of transcends all levels and and skills of the game and i wonder if it's probably the same across many sports where the mistakes are always going to be the same yeah, I can relate to that in football. It's like the first thing you learn when you start playing football is if you're defending the ball, don't pass it in the center of your own goal. And I still see that mistake being made in uh, in professional football. Sometimes yeah. you're like, how how does that happen? <laughs> exactly. It's, 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 it's the and most that's what, basic thing. And that's why it's a mistake, right? And it's yeah. like, but that's still, e- even at the highest level, well, you know, it could be like the reason people make this mistake is because they're under pressure. They feel like they're going to mess up if they if they do something else. So they feel like they have to do it. And then, obviously, if you're a kid or a professional, you can be in that position where you end up doing it, you know? Right, yeah. Well, it's you're also still the, the split-second decision-making, too. It's just like sometimes yeah. you you only have like two or three options, and you just pick one just purely much at random, and it happens to be the wrong one, and it ends in the back of your net. It sucks, but it happens all the time. I think it's uh, an expression from the fighting game scene that you outthink yourself. So the mind game goes, I cannot pass in front of my own goal. That's a bad idea. And everyone knows that, so therefore... They won't expect me to pass in front of my right. own goal. Yeah, yeah, outsmart the the competition. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, outsmart by, yourself by, by doing the, the unexpected because everybody knows. Oh, he's going to go up the boards with this pass, but but oh no, it's in the middle of the net now. It's like oh well, <laughs> why would you do <laughs> that? <laughs> Or it's like you think, you know, oh, it's just this one time I can get yeah. away with it, right? Sure. Right. Yeah, and, and I, mean, I do wonder if the same could be said about speed running if the mistakes newer players make are the same as the the, the top players and I, a very interesting question I, I feel like it might not quite be like that to be honest i feel like speedrunning might be unique in that way yeah well there's a giant I... learning curve involved and i think once you get to a certain position you don't really make those lower level mistakes anymore but uh some maybe i'm wrong about that i don't know but well specifically about mario Kart, i still miss zoom starts so there's that well that's just fundamental <laughs> so <laughs> Ne- nevertheless, yeah, it's but an yeah. interesting concept, though. Uh, I think I agree with something Goose's conclusion. There. You don't make the same mistakes, and, and like it might just be because new players. Uh, yeah, like, I'm trying to think of like a situation where you're 100 hours into a grind of a level. You're a top player. You know how it goes, and it's like you make a, a poor decision. But like speed is different because it's not decisions. It's like intentful play and kind yeah. of muscle memory, you know? And you don't go for the same stuff that you're yeah, going that... for as a beginner. Exactly. Yeah, the muscle memory is a, a, a big part, like especially for Super Mario Kart. Like if you just picked up a controller and started playing now, like like Carol and I would probably make better decisions, I guess, because we're just a little bit technically more sound. But like when we first started, we weren't anywhere near where we are now, but we'd never make the mistakes we make as kids unless you miss Zoom starts like Carol does all the time. <laughs> so throw some shade, sorry. <laughs> I was asking for it. Right. Um, so back to the elephant in the room. I guess we'll uh, have that as our last topic then. I still had a question about... Oh, sure, Carol. Uh, well, post, po- about post about the in- inevitable. About the YouTube channel. Uh, yeah. I just watched today your new episode on Speedrun News. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, how do you select which games are worthy for speedrun news, and if you ever envision adding other games in the future, uh, how how does that process go? Well, like, okay, in, in, this is the fourth time I've done speed news, so it's still pretty new to me. The series that I'm uh, that I'm, and it's a very occasional thing too, right? It's like only when it's I'll really only do a speed news episode when there's a bunch of insane gold my records to talk about. So the first one I did was only Goldeneye. 
And I think the second one I did was GoldenEye plus Choco Mountain. And I threw in the Choco Mountain there because I think it was a little bit after I did the Matias video. So I knew people liked watching the Mario. I got a gauge. People liked watching Mario Kart videos. And the Choco Mountain records were relevant because of the Summoning Soul video as well, right? Yeah. And then since then, I've done GoldenEye and Mario Kart. And usually Mario Kart 64, there's only one or two. I just talk about Matthias and, and, and Dan, right? Like, that's pretty much all that's going to be happening. Yeah. Um, so it's it's very easy to just throw the Mario Kart records in. And then, you know, th- this time I I, ta- I threw in Ocarina of Time and Metroid. I, I, the Ocarina of Time is a big deal, but I don't want to talk about it too much because I'm not that much of an expert in it. So we'll just kind of throw it in there. Just kind of like that style, though. It's well, like, uh, at least you met, it's an honorable mention. It's kind of like what, whatever I feel is going to fit. I mean, N64, so I know the big Nintendo games. A lot of people years ago had trouble like, oh, no, one game is more popular than others for speedrunning. It's all equal, you know, type of people. But like, no, like some some speed games are more popular than others. And I obviously know which ones those are. So if a big record happens in those games, I'd, I'd be more inclined to to mention it, right? And I noticed that you, uh, well, you you do keep track of MK64 world record developments, but strictly non shortcuts. Because actually, VAJ did a shortcuts Mario Raceway Lab world record. That uh... it, it it's true, and like I, I didn't I didn't know that, I didn't even like look to see. Mm-hmm. But I could have easily have looked to see and thrown that in. Um, but this one, I, yeah, I was just kind of tacking on the Mario Kart 64 at the end because. Like there were like the the four records I talked about in Goldeneye before were, were really big. I could have I could have done yeah. an episode just on Goldeneye, and mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? I'll throw in this this Mario Kart stuff. People like following the the Matthias story, exactly. right? That's kind of yeah. That's the big deal. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I figured with the MK64 stuff. The when or if it happens, the thirty two thing. But honestly, I think Matthias could do it. Uh, this end of this month is going to play Donkey Kong Jungle Parkway again. Which is sort of the only obstacle, right? But let me just add, by the way, that I think um, as a segment on its own, by its own merits, uh, without the 32-32 necessarily Mm -hmm. being a justification for it, I think the Mario 64 corner of World Record News is a cool thing to have on this news bulletin. No, exactly, right? Because it's kind of like I don't know. It just it just I know there's a lot of people who aren't involved in the communities, and they don't know. And it's like you know, here's a little bit of information. Now they know. Yeah, it's it's cool. Uh, I feel like the Golden Eye and the Mario Kart 64 players page has always sort of gone hand in hand. Definitely. Too much overlap. I mean, some people know other people. Some people play both, but they're sort of separate, uh, yet having the same journey in a way. A hundred percent, like they're kind of best friends of speedrun communities. Well, it could be because we go back a very, very long time. <laughs> like I don't really know many communities on the internet that go back further than 1998, and that's no. It's kind of the the longest running two games if you don't include like arcade fraud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, exactly. I, I, <laughs> I always. I always hear about like, oh yeah, Doom speedrunning, Quake speedrunning. These are older. Yeah. Like, I don't think they have quite the same community and following and whatnot, right? So that's what that's all it is. That was the rise of SDA, though, correct? Um, it certainly speed... had a lot to do with it. The, the demos archive, the demos yeah. were. I think it was Doom. You know, we were yeah. automatically yeah. saved demo file you could submit, and that's where it comes from. Absolutely. Yeah, so that is old, but I don't feel like the Doom part really survived in a big sense. So well, all you have to all you have to think is like, when was the last time you saw a video about Doom speedrunning that had hundreds of thousands of views? I, it's not that long ago, but I don't want to say hundreds of thousands, but some some guy maybe maybe Goose pointed out that there was like a long standing untied doom world record it was probably easy scape had had that oh uh, video. right yeah yeah right but it's like okay but like that video wasn't just about doom you know no 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 definitely whereas there have been videos just about mario kart and just about goldeneye that had this sort of attention right so what i'm saying is that the 
overall attention on Doom right now is much lower than these other games, Mario Kart and Goldeneye. Absolutely. I'm at best doing Devil's Advocate at, at best. Uh, I, I make no claim for that case that Doom is alive and kicking. I, I think people only even include Doom in these conversations because like they feel like, oh yeah, like I kind of have to talk about Doom. It's like one of the first speed games, but like there's just no relevance to it anymore at all. No, I don't feel like there is. I, the, the console equivalent of Doom, Goldeneye, uh, <laughs> certainly has to market on that these days. <sighs> right, so uh, any more questions, Carol, or should I try the thing? Um, yeah, I got maybe uh, a question for uh, for Goose again. Is uh, I, th I think it's fair to say that you're spending the bulk of your gaming related time uh, nowadays on producing YouTube content and videos rather than actually competing yourself. Correct me if I'm wrong in saying that. But, Entirely, uh, cr I, I haven't speed run since February. Okay, so I've been in a phase like that myself where I felt like commentating and creating content content felt more rewarding and less frustrating. Uh, but in the end, I switched back to competing again because you don't get that adrenaline rush and the ego boost when you're on the sideline. So my question would be, do you envision yourself competing more again in the future? Well, see, the thing is, I do get that adrenaline rush and ego boost. Maybe not quite adrenaline. Well, I, no, okay. I definitely get the ego boost when I see a lot of views and I see my YouTube you know, analytics page and revenue page and I see the subscribers go up and it's like, hell yeah, that's a huge ego boost, right? Right. The adrenaline rush, though, I mean, last night when I'm there trying to finish this speed news video and people are playing Cradle and getting the world records, I'm like, oh, my God, how do I add this into the episode? Like, that was pretty <laughs> intense. That was a lot of fun. It kind of felt like, uh, you know, maybe being in a news studio on a big news night and, like, you have to get it out there and figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, at the end of the video, you saw what I did. I, I, I didn't really dive into the Cradle records. I just put this kind of teaser um for now i have to do another video about cradle right so it, it is kind of exciting that way to stay on top of it and so i think okay and all that being said obviously there's still that like allure of like oh my god i could return to golden eye i could get some insane record it'd be really epic and i wouldn't count that out it is completely possible i'll return someday in fact earlier this summer i actually bought a mario kart 64 Japanese cartridge. Uh, oh. I wanted to. I was like, I should play this and uh, try to improve my PVs, and that might be fun to do kind of more casually. So, yeah, I mean, right now I'm doing what I'm doing, but I think at some point I'll come back and play. Who knows though? Are you ranked on the MK64 uh, time trial rankings? I think I'm somewhere in the in like the two hundreds. I think oh. I was like between Elite A and King F, somewhere like that. Right, so there's a rivalry between us without us knowing. I'm, I'm in the same <laughs> ballpark range. <laughs> there you go. I'll do a head-to-head -head after. <laughs> I mean, 200 is not that shabby in MK64. There's uh, north of 1,000, right? Yeah, and you got to do uh, MTs on the straights, I think, on some tracks at least, to be of that level. Oh, that's the cutoff? 200, you have to do straight MTs? I think so. Okay, yeah, so you might be right. On average finish, I'm ranked 236th, and Carl is ranked 228th, eight ranks ahead. So close. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew. <laughs> All right. This is a rivalry in the making, huh? So, Goose, if you play it for a few hours, you will pass me. <laughs> Potentially, <laughs> yeah. Now. And Isa Smith is 208th, pretty close to us. Whoa. Uh, that's already <laughs> an effort, though. <laughs> Uh, just a quick question. What was the reasoning behind the Japanese cartridge? I think it was just cheaper. Oh, right. Yeah. Is, <laughs> is, there any, is there any big differences I have to watch out? I don't think there are any. You just no, get the troll. The, the, the sounds of Toad are just annoying. <laughs> right. There may be uh, locational kappa differences. Uh, but as for the gameplay itself, I think it's 100% uh, like the NTSC version. Yep. There you go, good stuff. And the the cartridge is prettier, of course. Yeah, it is, yeah. That's a rule, right? The NTSC box, uh, the Japanese box art is almost always better. 
in my opinion. I guess that's how you localize for America. You make it more American. Kappa. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you get to defend your country, Joe. I'm not going to defend anything. <laughs> no. We'll get uh, Harvey on next time to defend yes, that. Yes, he's the next guest for sure. Yeah, it'll, it'll take three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really don't want to tag this on at the end, but... Um, well, can I uh, say something really quick? I am never going to get to this. Okay. <laughs> We're just trying to avoid the elephant in the room, I guess. Uh, I was just going to say, Goose, um, you have a very good channel on YouTube, obviously. Um, the content is great. Uh, I like a lot of your videos. But uh, was there one, any one video in particular that kind of like, well, you quote unquote, launched your uh, your YouTube career, if you will? Well, ironically, it's kind of weird is that, okay, so I guess going back to 2014, I did sort of an impromptu streets speed lore on stream. It was 20 minutes long. And a lot of people really like that. I didn't put it on YouTube for about a year. I just had it as a Twitch highlight. And the reason I wanted to do that was so people could understand what went into Ryan Lockwood's Streets 112 and why it was such a big deal, why he was freaking out. Well, so I did that, people like it. right? <laughs> well, and, but there's more to it, right? As, yeah, and, yeah. and as I explained that, you know. And so, like, I wanted to explain why skipping 113 was such a big deal. So I did that in 2014. I put it on YouTube in 2015. And then I was kind of in college, you know, I was kind of out of it for a while, for a couple of years. And then when I came back to streaming in 2017, I knew I wanted to do like a full-blown speed lore series. And I did the first episode, which was Frigate, Secret Agent, where I talked about all the splices and Henning Blom, this kind of stuff. And that one got picked up, like Kotaku did an article about it. It, it, it immediately went to like 70,000 views, which was way more than I was expecting. And, um, yeah, so that blew up. And I was like, holy smokes, the potential of this is insane. And then from there, two more videos were the top five most stunning instances of degeneracy in GoldenEye. <laughs> and, like, that one, like, I, it's insane. That one has 170,000 views. I never, I made that one as, like, a fun joke for the elite community, basically. I was expecting, it, like, 5,000 views. And it has a, over 160,000 Um so that one blowing up as much as it did. And then the following speed lore episode, Depot Agent. Um, that one was huge too. Like so all of this stuff combined, the speed lores and that degenerate video, um, were like were were probably what launched it and was like, Holy smokes, I'm onto something here and just keep rolling with it. So it was never a conscious decision then until that point. Well, I think I wanted to do the speed lore stuff and then I think at one point last year, I kind of was like, I just got kind of fed up, like, my Twitch channel's not growing that much. And, like, okay, obviously I'm playing GoldenEye, it's not going to grow that much. But I just wanted to do more than just, like, play grinding on stream all day, and then once a month doing a speedler episode with a couple other videos sprinkled in. And that's why, like, in February this year, I'm just like, honestly, I've had enough playing. Now I'm just going to just do videos. And that's I don't know, I'm just a lot, a lot happier doing it. It's a lot more enjoyable for me. And, uh, yeah, just what can I say? I, I feel like it's the right decision entirely. And it's just kind of one thing leads to another, right? But I would say the streets speed lore is sort of the initial spark to it all. And that wouldn't have happened without Lockwood getting 112. So you say Lockwood's responsible for your YouTube success? <laughs> in, in in a huge way, absolutely. Cool. And a, another another tiny piece of the puzzle is also meeting Ari two nine two nine at HDQ twenty fifteen. He had just passed like ten thousand subscribers on YouTube and was telling me about it and all that kind of stuff. And I had it in the back of my mind that it would be really cool to do. Uh, but again, I was like in college and you know dealing with other you know personal life stuff, and it took me two years to get around to it. But just you know the people like the path of your life it's never like one individual event right there's always things that lead you to where you are today that's true that's very true sure so i'll uh, try desperately for one last segue huh can i say one more thing <laughs> no <I'm> just... <laughs> and I, so the... I, I, I'm, I'm hoping for a certain topic i guess you know but we'll see <laughs> yeah anal bleach <laughs> Your thoughts? <laughs> no, so uh, you have to segue, by the way. <laughs> Brace yourself. So, yeah, that was the start of your uh, 
uh, well, the transition from Twitch to the start of the YouTube career, right? Soon there's going to be a video coming up on your YouTube channel, correct? I, I assume, but it might keep getting delayed with more and more news and world records and stuff, yeah. I, I gotta give it. I gotta give the elite community a big 10 thumbs up for keeping it sort of the uh, uh, urgency of the uh, the scene it still seems so alive they're still on tides i mean this cradle strat has me baffled how does this happen 20 years later it, it was so it was so weird because three nights ago we're in chat and someone posted the the, the tas where henrik stays on the right side of the of the room and he shoots out the console um, but yeah. I looked at him like, why are we running to the left of this thing? Like, what are we thinking? And it just, it clicked. But, uh, but I know, but anyways, go, go on, right? You're, you're right. It's the community is so alive and thriving because of this, you know, and I'm, you know, it's kind of uh, honking my own horn, but like, no, it's, no, I it's think you're truth. correct. Yeah, I, I definitely think you're correct. And when you do the speed lore thing and you mentioned like this certain level had 10 ties in this year. And then you go 2015, it had 30 ties, and 2016, it had 50. And then it's sort of an exponential growth uh, just about the time you started doing your stream and YouTube channel. So Definitely. Maybe not hand in hand, but it's definitely impactful. Let's make no mistake about that. Uh, yeah, so we are from the Mario Kart scene from back in the day, and you are from the Elite scene, and we... Like I mentioned, they have sort of parallel stories, but we've been body communities, uh, if you will. But there is one significant overlap, and that is the player Steven Swartz. Very uh, much so. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to get into a whole song and dance. I feel like the dust has kind of settled when it comes to the... Uh, you know the t the the forum topics, the back yeah, and forth, the that's sort of conclusion. So, yeah, so that's sort of settled now. So I I think we're all just eagerly awaiting your video. Uh, that being said, I feel like this story got sort of an um, what's the word I'm looking for? Anticlimactic conclusion in the end. In a way, and. You know, uh, I mean, you guys, you guys kind of know how it all played out. Like, really, even before I made the Matthias video, like, I've always had these ideas in mind of topics I want to tackle and make videos about. And so, stuff like the, you know, the, the Hab Trio is a great ex that. That's always kind of this back burner. I'm going to do that eventually. I have all these, you know, whatever it's Goldeneye, Mario Kart. There are these great stories to be told, and I want to do them justice. And so I always thought about doing a Stephen Short his story. And so after the Matthias video and was released and people really enjoyed that one, I, I made that thread of Mario Kart forums, you know, Stephen Short is the Todd Rogers of N64. And I thought it was a completely reasonable comparison. And I thought like, I thought like maybe a few people would post some information, you know, the, the thread might have eight or 12 posts, like, yeah, ha ha. Like these times were never proven. Like here's some links. That's it. <laughs> I was never expecting it to become this full blown, massive investigation that took place over four months. And I never expected Jortis to come back and attempt to sort of prove himself. And when he did, I guess I would say the conclusion that was reached didn't surprise me um but it was it was a crazy sequence of events i mean i have a lot of thoughts on this uh first off i i don't feel like he actually came back and tried i think he just got his toe in the water and then it sort of fizzled out uh especially now but he did show up at the super mario kart world championship in uh, in holland so he, he was on his way i feel to getting back into gaming and when the whole removal of times slash ban stuff happened uh, i kept talking to him a bit because he was getting back into gaming as i mentioned and then we had a lot of chats which games what are you going to do first i was sort of eager to see where this was going but now he seems a bit out of it uh like he put the brakes on or something uh, let's say so look i i would love nothing more than to see him come back and pull off the strategy and show us it would be 
amazing. It would be the coolest story ever. That would be the best story. That would get the most views by far. I want that to happen. But it's clear that this is not the case, and this is not how it played out 15 years ago. Um, you know, this... How do you put it? This, okay, a good point. I'm going to collaborate with Carl Jobs on this video as well because Carl has yeah. all these crazy thoughts on it. But something Carl brings up is this. Any rational person in his situation would know, like, okay, this looks really bad on my part. I did this 15 years ago. This happened. But I can understand why no one believes me. I can understand why they're upset. I understand why it looks bad. Most rational people would think that way and they would kind of be behave and react accordingly but because he gets like so offended that nobody believes him oh my you know you, you guys are so mean nobody believes me that kind of adds credence to the fact that he's a liar trying to defend his lies and like i told you in the private chat i i agree that's how it looks and to all <laughs> Uh, to all who looks upon, and that's how it is. But me and Carol, having met Stephen several times, I, I cannot share that impression beyond the actual words you read and stuff. It does seem like that. But there seems I, to be a big discrepancy between how he posts online and how he behaves offline. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so when you confront him about this topic in his native language in Dutch, he doesn't. But of course, he doesn't feel attacked by us because. We don't maybe openly ask the right questions, as you guys do. No, well, I'm, so I'm we just don't press him on the issue enough, maybe. But he do yeah. certainly does not come across like that, like he does <laughs> on the elite forum. Have you ever asked him straight up, like, did you perform this strategy and get Aztec Agent One Thirty One in the year two thousand three? Have uh, you, Sargoff? Yeah, I I did when it was. So Stephen visited visited me back in whichever year 2009 maybe so he was very active in gaming from uh sort of 2007 until 2010 or so he was the world champion of trackmania then before he turned to poker correct carol yeah yeah i think there's a sort of the how things turn out but during that period he came to visit me for like a week or maybe longer and we just played games and had fun, I guess. And, and then I got sort of drunk and sort of pressed him on the issue about the Luigi Raceway, and uh, which is sort of a similar claim in many ways. But Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I asked maybe, him straight maybe, up about yeah. the Luigi Raceway, but not about the Aztec. But no, I, I asked... Know, he, he answered me. I, yeah, he did it, but how much does that prove? I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, the thing about Goldeneye is I never took the same interest in the Aztec time Oh, okay, so let me rewind a bit. Sure. The reason I know Steven was because of a topic like this 10 years ago, whatever, maybe more. And I, I was sort of genuinely curious, did you do this? I'm not trying to put you on the spot or claim you did or didn't. I mean, did, did, did this happen? Then cool, we should have a video, but that, that's sort of it. But then he showed up for the NLG07, and after that we sort of stayed friends for a while, and just watching him game in that period from 2007 to 10 was an absolute blast in all the games he touched, if it was like a small Flash game or whatever, uh, all the way to the, the Trackmania stuff. And I was sort of blown away by this guy's unique approach to gaming, because he thinks out of the box in a way... I, I don't know anyone else who does it quite like that. But I never knew enough about Goldeneye to make heads or tails of that claim, to be honest. And Luigi Raceway, he sort of invented a strategy of uh, mini-turboing or shrooming into the wall to get sort of a mystery boost, which was re revealed some years later, I believe. Now, did he invent that, or did he claim there was a mystery boost, and then years later the community found it, and it was like, oh yeah, that's what I did. You know, like, we don't really know. I, I'm trying to remember if that boost was in the the video, the the world record he did have. Uh, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't? No, I don't think so. so oh, like, okay. Is this just a case of like the Aztec glass finally yeah, the, opening. The hindsight strap. Of, of, of him saying, oh, this is what I did, and then something resembling that took place, yeah. 
and now he can claim that's what he did, you know? You know, the sad part, Goose, about this is I, I can't argue that. That's That seems sound. I mean, yeah, it, it does seem that way. Uh, but I don't remember exactly how... Uh, and then it's like my question about, okay, I don't doubt that you guys watched him play all sorts of games, Flash games, Nintendo games, and he was great. I don't doubt it. Why is none of this documented in any way? Why are there no videos of like, wow, this is what happened, this crazy, we were all competing for this record, and he did it, you know? Why is there no story like the AGDQ 100-meter dash, but now it's Steven Jortis who shows up and gets the record? I, I, I hear his stories, I don't see any evidence yeah, of this happening. Fair enough, but I, I think there are videos. I mean, I have some on my old hard drives, which I may or may not be able to extract, but that's okay. Not it requires very... also storytelling, in a way, which was not around back then. Like, we didn't have a goose in our midst in 2010 or 2008. Which no, was and the, the and I understand, happen. but even like forum threads and like this kind of stuff, they're it's just so lacking in in supporting evidence. It, it was a different era. I mean, there was some resurface videos from the Nintendo World Championship in Holland, but I don't know if, if it was the one Steven won. Carol, do you... No, I have no idea. <laughs> and, it, and it's like, okay, that's fair too, but it's like, okay, um, for example, I could tell the story, and I did in, in, in one of the Aztec Speedlore episodes, it's a sort of non-related story of Ilu and Boss having this rivalry where Boss leaves to play Banjo-Kazooie and Ilu makes fun of him. And we have footage of Boss playing Banjo-Kazooie and getting this single-level record. And this was in 2006, yeah, not quite the same era as Jorty's, but an old era, and there's evidence there, right? So it's like, I can point to these other stories where there is evidence for these very yeah. small, obscure, tidbit side stories, but there's none for... You know, I, I, I've i seen the vid, I've seen his Star Fox two hours video, I've seen this this stuff that Axel Zacherson uploaded, but it's it's doesn't support... It supports that he played these games, but not much else. I mean, I heard you guys say that there's very little video evidence, and I, I guess that's true today, but that wasn't the case back in the day. But it's like, everything around Schwartz sort of when you know, maybe not at the time in 2001, but when you look back upon it 15 years later, it's like these are sort of all the intentful motions of a liar. You know, he put just enough videos out there to say, you know, oh, I have some videos, people have seen me play, um, but there's no videos of what you want to see, actually. there's, It's so bizarre how, he, you know, if you look at the um, all-time tally of GoldenEye records, mm -hmm. he has like 80-something records and 37 untieds, and there are five videos that we have of him playing GoldenEye. None of them were world records. But, so it's like, why does he have five videos of Goldeneye, none of these 80 records that he claims? You know, it just bits and pieces to mislead people enough that they'll believe him. Yeah, I, I, it, it does fit your narrative, and if that's what you're looking to fill, you will get exactly what you want from Steven, because it just works out that way. And, you know, it could be that way, but it would be a massive shock to me if all of this stuff was lies, for well, sure. I think the the fact that we are from a Mario Kart background colors the picture a little bit differently from the beginning because he pretty much has proof for his 1999 Luigi Raceway world record, which was also, if you take it out of the equation, the 158.12 or 14, sorry. Yeah. Um, that was done in 2003, which is never really proven apart from the time scroll, which I have some doubts about myself, to be honest. But the 158.65 done in 1999 was far ahead of the curve. Uh, and there was a video of it. And by extension, you would tend to believe the other claims he did in Mario Kart 64, because that was the best one of the bunch, right? De definitely. But like I, I, I use the example of like the, the mountain climbing explorer in the thread, right? Like you could, I don't doubt that he got that record. And I don't doubt that he was a talented gamer. I doubt these specific claims and the fact that he's carried on 
um, claiming that this is the case, I, I, I now I doubt a lot of what he says, right? And so it's like, just because you are really good at something doesn't give you free reign to claim anything you want surrounding it. No, that's true. But you were talking earlier about the little tidbits and there was no supporting evidence of that whatsoever. But that would be supporting evidence of at least one tidbit, which is major because it was, it was ahead of the curve back in the day. And so the way the narrative has formed is that Schwartz was a good gamer when he was, when he was young and he had some of these great records. And then as he got older, he felt like, you know what, I don't want to bother myself with this any, anymore. I'm going to make up some crazy times. If, you know, no one believes me, big deal, I'm going to leave anyways. If they believe me, then then great. Kind of, kind of having a free roll on these lies, right? And so I think that he was really good and did prove sometimes back in 99 and, and whatnot. And then by 2003, he wasn't playing much. And these were kind of throwaway lies and just hoping people believe them based on his reputation. Uh, okay, uh, that's quite possible. Let me just add one small thing to the Luigi Raceway time, because, yeah, yeah, it all seems weird when you read the posts. Like, English is not his uh, strongest suit. Let's, uh, <laughs> let, okay, let's put that, that, uh, that out there. So, Carol, you can speak with him in Dutch. I'm sure that's helpful in some way. Yeah, yeah, it is. But the Luigi Raceway wasn't the the record he was going for. He was uh, posting times or single lap splits that would make up the most magnificent Sherbert Land three he, lap. He, he was he claimed in that post that uh, was it Carl who posted for him or was it someone else? Lush. Lush. Yeah, okay, yeah. so in that post it claims that Schwartz was warming up for Sherbert Land. Now, you know, riddle me this, right? If he's so good in 2003 that he gets this Luigi Raceway, uh, you know, 158.14 on a warm-up lap while he's trying to warm up for Sherbert Land, where are his Sherbert Land records? You know, why, did, why didn't he get those? Oh, but the same question goes, if he made up the Luigi Raceway, why not just ma make up the Sherbert Land while you're at it? No, uh, of course he, he could have done that as well. And he just didn't, but there's there's no evidence to suggest either, right? It's like, if, if this actually happened, and if he was legitimate, you would expect that he would have gone on to play Sherbert Land. But because it was all made up and it was a fantasy, he just got tired with, you know, it is a fair question, why did he stop lying? But it's like, why, you know, why does anyone stop lying? Why does anyone stop doing anything? It's, it's not an easy question to answer. No, that was my initial thesis, is that um, he came back uh, from 99 hiatus to 2003, whatever, and then he realizes, I'm really not on top in these games anymore. Let me just cement my legacy here. I'll figure out what times I can claim without being immediately outed as a fraud. And in that sense, those two claims really on the edge of what you can claim. Like, probably beyond. Definitely. Uh, and he made those two big claims to be remembered and then withdrew from both communities, whatever. That's sort of what happened and that's sort of what it looks like or looked like to many people. I'm certain I was one of those. I did not believe the claims initially. Uh, and I'm still on the fence, obviously. Without video, it doesn't really matter what we think at this point, does it? But witnessing him play games really made me respect the guy as a gamer. Never mind the the claims or whatever. That's just yeah. And I can completely understand. Uh, you know, I haven't seen him play right, so I, I'm not enchanted that same way. I do find it, uh, it interesting though how you said like in 2007 he showed up at some uh, event or whatever. Yeah. No uh, way. And that was recently after like his claims were being doubted again. So I do kind of find it interesting how he, he tends to show up when his claims are being doubted because he knows showing up in person is going to lend him credibility. You know, that's I what. Like, yeah, that's, I, th I think Patrick Wessels what the one, was the one who brought him out from hiding. Uh, Carol, do you remember this? Yeah, but it had nothing to do with uh, the topic about the Luigi Raceway questions. I think Patrick no, no. just said, hey, there are some retro game tournaments going to be played. Uh, do you want to participate again? 
That's yeah, right. Much why he came. And he did end up winning the Golden Eye. That's <laughs> and then Mario got sixty four. And, and one more, Fighter. yeah, f- it beat me in Street Fighter. I hate that. <laughs> you won three like, tournaments. <laughs> so, so this is the other thing, though. It's like you got, you guys talk about these tournaments as if they're these like major international tournaments that are like huge. I, I, I don't doubt that there's a lot of good players there, but it's not like he won like some actual world championships uh, sanctioned by Nintendo with tens of thousands of competitors. It's like he won a local tournament with no, those that don't exist guys. back in the day. No, of, of course, right? But it's like it's still kind of anecdotal evidence of that. That is is. Oh, made I'm not. To I'm not trying like to submit this. Is. No, I'm not trying to submit this as evidence. This is just an experience, and yeah, this no, has no, nothing, yeah, nothing to do with the uh, Luigi Raceway at all. So, so it's like, again, I don't, I don't doubt that he's really good at these games, um, but I do doubt these specific claims. As do we. Yeah, yeah. But you made up your mind, right? You believe he's a liar. I'm still on the fence a little bit, at least. No, sure. And it's yeah. it's there are so many of things he said and did that are consistent with other liars we've seen. Like li- like on the elite thread um, about the Jorta situation, the first post Jorta has made in that thread was something. You know, he says, "Yeah, I'm trying. I've kind of moved on. You know, I'm worried about other things, my family, etc." I'm just an old guy, you know, whatever. And the day that post was made, me and Carl Jobs talked about it, and we're like, he's planting seeds to bail on this later, using the stuff like family, not caring about it anymore. Lo and behold, two months later, that's exactly what he pulls, right? It's These things are very... It's, it's And it is the same thing Todd Rogers pulled. Like, once you've seen this sort of behavior, it becomes very predictable. I've got no defense. <laughs> No, no, I and it's like and it's like like I say like okay I obviously don't know either I don't know either and I know people are worried oh that you know there was one guy in particular on the elite thread saying I'm gonna ruin his life and ruin his kid's life and it's like come on dude I always do a pretty reasonable job I think um, of handling these situations if you if you watch my video on the Chuya attack ship record I went into that video fully thinking the time was fake and by the time i was done the video i i thought you know what i'm not sure and i don't really give my opinion in that video i kind of leave it open to to the viewer and that's what i plan on doing with with jorty's as well um you know i it could be no i mean i i, I just don't think it's possible to got aztec 131 it's just <laughs> i know i know you don't think that <laughs> it's, it's too it's too insane yeah, yeah, the Luigi Raceway would still be sort of within the realms of possibility, but the Aztec uh, is starting to become more and more unlikely as more knowledge is, you know, being put into the, the debate. And, and that's maybe why we see it a little bit differently between the Mario Kart and Goldeneye perspective, because in Mario Kart, the more you learn about Luigi Raceway, yeah, it's maybe possible he pulled off the mystery boost. You know, my theory is that he just pretend that was a strategy, the mystery boost. Um, may, but maybe he did it. But the, the so so the more you learn about Mario Kart, the more it sort of becomes possible. But the more you learn about Goldmine Aztec, the less his claim becomes possible. You know, right. so I think that's why our perspectives are different on this. Yeah, the the main difference there is the Luigi Raceway is certainly possible. Uh, we're talking about whether it or not it was possible that he did it at that point. The Aztec is a bit different. We're talking about if that's at all possible with Tass. And uh, all signs point to no. Exactly. And it's like some people will say, oh, well, 131 happened today. So, like, it, yeah, yeah, it. No. I'm like, okay, yeah, it, he could have used the exact same strategy and the exact same execution that we did for 131 10 years later. Um, but it's so unlikely and it, do- and, and it doesn't match what he's said about it. Let me just fr- try to phrase this for a second. So, I watched the. I know nothing about Perfect Dark. Attack Carrier, was that the one? Yeah, Attack Ship. Attack Ship, right. So I, I saw that video randomly because I don't really pay as much attention to Perfect Dark videos, but it was it was a cool episode. And that was like a, a Japanese guy with some poor footage, right? Yep. So, and that was uh, the roll of the dice. So that is definitely possible, but 
highly unlikely from an odds perspective, correct? Exactly, and his evidence isn't necessarily strong enough to make you believe something so unlikely. Right. So, uh, at this point, if there's somehow resurfaced a video in sort of shaky cam footage style of Swartz's doing 131, would you believe that on face value at this point? It, it, it would go. A, it would go a long way. It, it would. It would change the story entirely. Like it would be a huge piece of evidence. And the thing with any evidence is, it's like it's not necessarily a hundred percent guaranteed. You believe that evidence, or but it's always something to consider, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think you you proved i i'm using that word wrong i believe but you did some splicing as well at some point right and that was correct yeah proof of concept or attempts of a deranged man a hundred percent yeah yeah which one of the two was were you doing it to prove a point or oh like like kind of a combination like you kind of get so angry with something that you want to prove a point so a little bit of both because it would be quite possible to do uh, a one strat. I'm doing air quotes now, by the way. A one guard lower strat. Look behind the, what's it called? The console, wherever you hide. And it, then just it, splice it with a glass opening. It would be possible, absolutely. If with the, if it, Yes. Now, yeah. it, it might not be possible to... You know, there might be something like the guard's end position might be off or something, but like yeah. it would be possible to make it passable. Someone messed up that on Frigate, right? With the the gun showing or something? <laughs> yes, that's that's how Henning was, was caught after the record was on there for almost two years, yeah. So like that's so when, sad. <laughs> when I mean Bond, observant, I might add. When Bond leaves the stage, the weapon in the cutscene is the same weapon he was last holding. And if he wasn't holding a weapon, it's the PP7. So in Henning's case, he wasn't holding a weapon when he ended, but then Bond puts away like the Phantom or the D5K, not the PP7. Yeah. And so like that's as sure of a splice as if in Mario Kart you finish the run with Luigi and like the end screen showing <laughs> Yo Yoshi. Like, seriously, exactly. it's, it's, it's it's that and some okay, but it's not quite as obvious. Smoking gun, yeah. It's a smoking gun. Um, but still, for a, the Elite was pretty quiet back then, so for a year and a half, no one detected it until I came back and I, I knew immediately it was fake. Um, but, it's uh, you know, anyways, uh, I, we're kind of on the point of what is it possible Jorty's could splice a video that... No, that no, would... no. So there is not even a video, yeah. No, so, no that was a hypothetical. Uh, yeah. Would that even make a difference uh, <laughs> at this point? It, 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 it could. I mean, I don't think at, at this point it's kind of a, a long time gone. Like... Oh, why didn't this come out earlier? But like, if at some point on this, you know, when I started looking into this in May, if two months later, Jortis posted some sort of spliced video that seemed that we didn't know was spliced and seemed to show his strategy, that would have blown our minds. Yeah, every single person in the community would have tried it nonstop. If it were spliced, it probably wouldn't have worked, and so suspicion still would have been there. Sure. Right. Because the thing is, I, I do believe I can get him to keep on trying, which seems so, so dumb if he made it up back in well, the day. It, it, it sort of is, but it's like, okay, I still am three or four videos away from making the, the, the Jortis video now, yeah. but there's still three or four weeks or more. It's like, could something change? I, I don't know. Now, right now, he's really on a down slope as when it comes to gaming so uh i would have to spike his interest somehow uh, so yeah i don't think you're gonna see much progress from his side at this point uh and i kind of yeah, hope he doesn't post anymore because that's doing him no favors in any direction um, and, and i'm not expecting him to you know miraculously show up you know i kind of think it is the end of the saga and i'm kind of treating it as such unless something else ends up happening right i'm not waiting on anything now yeah no, right that makes sense right i i just think uh i mean there's been some flack back and forth some less than uh charitable utterings <laughs> in regards to steven uh but yeah i i'm i have complete confidence that your video be will be in good taste 
yeah, and all this, all the stuff about his uh, family and friends going to shit because of the video. I don't think anyone. I think Carol said this in the topic as well. Nobody actually holds that position. That's just. Nah. I, think there's, I think there's one guy who does. Yeah, there was one post, but I don't even know I mean, if it, who that guy is. Even if you were a complete jackass about this and did went out to destroy his reputation, yeah, you no. still not have that power because it's likely his employer is not even going to, you know, care, right? So, exactly. exactly. And, th yeah. and nowadays, like, so many people have bad shit that's lies written about them online, right? Like, I know it's 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 absurd, and I would end up looking bad, you know. And and I obviously don't want to do that. No, right, right. Okay, should we try closing the door? Yeah. This this topic could go on, but at this point, it's just nah, it resolved around its own momentum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think yeah. so. Yeah. I have one quick question, uh, which doesn't interrupt the Sargot seg segue this time. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that your in your videos your production values are rapidly increasing. Is yeah. that ju just you acquiring more skills, or are you getting help from uh, software savvy friends? I'm definitely not um, getting like having anyone help me. Really, um, a few months ago, I did go buy a subscription to like a stock footage place. So there's some stock footage I can use. Plus, a lot of the backgrounds and stuff um, I've kind of made using those pieces. So that helps a lot. And then just every now and then I'll, I'll like search for a tutorial how to do something, which helps a bit. So, I mean, it's good that it's noticeable that it's improving, but like I don't think it's improving that quickly, to be honest. So, you know, oh, you, can always, you can always do more. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all me still at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it, I think it's uh, coming up. In a nice way. Uh, it, there used to be a lot of spinning goose logos or whatever I'm going to call those. And uh, now there's like more small, small clips. There's more sound effects. I actually quite enjoy the sound effects more than I should. I think just <laughs> old cool. chest openings from Zelda or whatever it is. Sometimes it's just so enjoyable. Exactly, but the thing is, now I'm worried that I'm run. I'm going to overuse all these sounds. I need more sounds, right? So, it's a, you're always a challenge that's hard to get ahead of. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you plan on uh, expanding in a way to have like a sub channel or people helping you out, or do you just want to do your own thing and just? I've entertained the idea of like separating speed lore onto its own channel um because i kind of feel like those ones are never going to be like the viral million view videos right they're always going to have their own fan but then i think like i mean really a lot of it is like i look at pewdiepie he doesn't separate anything it's just all his channel when he does an hour-long uh let's play of a game he keeps on his main channel even though nowadays he's more known for you know the meme 10 minute videos and so if the biggest youtuber in the world does it that way I think it's reasonable to follow that path, you know. Do you want to be a follower? Well, no, I mean, but it's like you learn, you learn what tech. If if the best, if the top of the, you know, if the best person in this field does it this way, it's probably for a reason. Oh, uh, I usually uh, have a strong divide between best and most successful. Those are not the same things to me. I have seen a bit of PewDiePie, and I find it, you know, it's not my cup of tea. No. <laughs> I, I, think, better. <laughs> I think the thing with him is that because he's been number one for so long, it really shows that he's doing something right. You know, a lot of people, there's that old saying, getting to number one takes a lot of work. Staying there takes even more, you know? And he stayed that's there for like, quote. <laughs> he's, he's stayed there for like five five years, so he's he obviously is a master of the game, and I think it's worth considering all the things he does um, very strongly. I mean, in Norway, this is a backwards-ass country uh, in terms of technology and stuff like that. Uh, he got he got hugely known here because of the whole Nazi thing. If yeah, you recall the controversy yeah, yeah. that that was on the news in Norway and stuff, and then he just gains a bunch of followers because of that. Uh, the controversy, I mean, and that that's not 
as a price that controversy sell sells. Oh, it's a very old trick. It's uh, but it's like when you when you watch him and see the controversy, he doesn't set out there to make controversy. You know, it's like it just kind of happens. He's just a man of the internet, and I can relate very strongly to him because I grew up the same way, just online all the time, and you you kind of have the same upbringing as, in terms of what jokes you you find funny. And, oh sure, yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's just it's what can you say? There's obviously a lot of the newer guys who get more daily views um, are the vloggers and look at my merch and look how cool I am, <laughs> right? And and he's not like that at all. He's he's an internet guy, so uh, I respect it a lot. He's a bit of a pioneer in that sense, that's for sure. But I mean, you know, you know, like you originally got to this point with, it's like, am I going to do sub channels? I think like right now, no, I'm just going to just just keep it, keep the momentum rolling with our white goose and see where we go. Right, I, I do agree with the uh, the thought about splitting the speed lore into separate sort of thing, because I'm in a very different mood watching your 20 minutes this just happened type videos and the two and a half hours this is how degeneracy evolved the last 20 years in this track in this level <laughs> so definitely those, yeah and my hope is that eventually i'll get to a point where i'll be doing more than two or three or four videos a month i'll be doing like 10 or 15 and then the monthly speed lore will be kind of its own separate thing and people will know like it's not going to be it'll be like a special treat as opposed to a main kind of content sure so i say we wrap it up i think uh yeah. i think i'm way overdue to get back to the wrench duties of my life <laughs> so i just want to thank you so much ryan for coming on the show it's been a surprisingly good chat and i don't mean that in a bad way uh about everything from fucking hockey to uh, <laughs> the, the gaming of the nineties. Definitely, it was a it was a great chat with you guys. You know, we all um, come from the same place online, similar, and uh, you know, we can all get along. And and it was certainly a very interesting chat today. So thanks for having me. All right, and thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for coming Any on. Any time, guys. I, I I'd love to do it again sometime. So thank you. So meanwhile, I'll speak on the behalf of everyone in the Carthritis Society. I think when we look forward to your video on the <laughs> several topics, goose. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> it's, been, yeah it's great content. I, I have to I have to admit I'm I'm usually pretty enthralled by what any video you make. Well, thank you very much. And like I say, you know, be patient because I have a, a slate. Of other stuff to make before you know that the, the Jorta stuff in sure. particular. So two who knows what will happen? Wanna, two videos I want to push for is the Eric Habrick trio <laughs> that I really want to see you cover, and of course Terence Fenner. Oh, the Fenner. <laughs> oh, Fe <laughs> yeah, Fenner. Well, oh, and, and one listening. just 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 before we leave, another interesting one would be Miles uh, oh, Verkim yes. because of course the Antelope of Death. He, he he was in the if if he peaked with his stuff in 2013 as opposed to you know early 2000s he could have been one of the most famous speedrunners you know achievement guys in history and he's just a, a man in the wrong yes. time yeah. yeah no exactly and, yeah. but something happened huh uh, well <laughs> yeah that's no, an episode I'll... to look forward to sure. yeah looking forward to that too all right that's it for this episode guys uh thank you so much and i will see you later Oh, see ya. Yeah. Bye bye. Stay true.